our uh, online symposium on uh, ECG and pedia on X-ray on the cardiac disorders. Uh, we had that la last two days, we had described mainly the ECG changes of different cardiac disorders and the X-ray changes in different cardiac disorder. Today, we mainly focus on the management part. And also at the end, we have a very uh, interesting and exciting quiz with the uh, prize, attractive prizes. So be with us all of the day, uh, uh, all throughout the uh, uh, last uh, next two, three, two to three hours. Now today, uh, with for this program, uh, Dr. Debobroto Nondi and Dr. Malubika Maiti will be the conveners. And Dr. Anil Singh, he, he has not joined, will be joining soon. He will be the expert for today's program. So over to you, Debobroto and Malubika, and start today's program. Good evening, Meita. Good evening, everyone. Uh, good evening, Sakurna, sir. Uh, so today, our uh, first topic of this evening is management of tachyarrhythmia. I'd like to invite Dr. Malubika Maiti. Uh, she has done her MD pediatrics and DNP pediatric cardiology from Portis Escorts Hospital, New Delhi. She is currently attached to Apollo Multispecialty Hospital as consultant pediatric cardiologist and also attached to Medical College and Hospital, Kolkata, under Shiru Shati Project. Uh, Dr. Malavika, you can start sharing your slides, please. Thank you. Dr. Malavika, please unmute. Thank you, sir. Uh, for nice introduction. Uh, arrhythmia in infants and children, uh, recognition is very difficult for parents. Often they present with vague non-specific symptoms like fast breathing, lethargy, poor feeding, reduced urine output. Many times they complain that infant is not old, they are fussy, they are not taking food. Larger child can self-report of uneasiness in chest, palpitation, chest uh, pain and abdominal pain. And identification is easy for pediatrician as it involves counting the heart rate. There are few essential steps in management of a child of, uh, to arrhythmia. Do not panic if situation under control. Constant monitoring of breathing pulse by blood pressure. Do not rush to treat. ECG on the monitor may be misleading. Take 12 lead ECG or 6 lead uh, limb lead ECG. Identification and documentation of underlying reading is important. Now regarding tachycardia, there is narrow QRS tachycardia and wide QRS tachycardia. Uh, among narrow QRS tachycardia, when atrial and ventricular rate are same, uh, the, the differential diagnosis are AV NRT, AV RT, and when atrial rate are more than ventricular rate, the differentials are atrial uh, tachycardia, atrial fibrillation, atrial flatter with variable block, ectopic atrial tachycardia, and when uh, QRS is wide, atrial and ventricular rate are same, the differentials are ventricular tachycardia, SVT with aberration or bandle branch block. And when ventricular rate is more, then our differential is ventricular tachycardia. There are different pharmacotherapies for SVTs, fetal SVT and ventricular tachycardia. These are acute therapy, prophylactic therapy, and transplacental therapy for fetal SVT, and also invasive therapy. The Dr. therapy... Uh, yes, sir. Sorry to, sorry to interrupt you. There is an echo happening, so... If you can uh, speak with, you know, just a bit away from your uh, microphone. Okay, okay. Happening, okay? No, thank you. Please carry on. Treatment depends on the hemodynamic status. Whether the child is hemodynamically stable or unstable. If hemodynamically stable, we can use vagal maneuver, IV adenosine, IV amygdalin, IV diltiazem. If the if the child is hemodynamically unstable, we directly use DC cardioversal. Uh, and we should use uh, ketamine and irazolam uh, for analgesia and sedation of the child if uh, time is there. Adenosine administration uh, is uh, due to AV nodal uh, is uh, is act uh, it acts by AV nodal block. Uh, in case of AVRT and AVNRT, it causes sudden termination and sudden, uh, sinus rhythm is diverted back. In case of sinus tachycardia, junctional tachycardia, ventricular tachycardia, there is no effect and it slows or unmasks the atrial flutter, ectopic atrial tachycardia. 
in case of bagel maneuvers we uh, put ice bag application uh, over nose and mouth for 10 to 15 seconds and we avoid the eye burst it can be alarming uh, very alarming if we put uh, ice ball ice bag uh, over the eye burst uh, the success rate is 30 to 60 percent bagel maneuver is uh, used in case of older children only carotid massage is avoided in infants and small children how adenosine is given? Adenosine is given in anticubital vein with 3 way cannula. Preferably two people uh, are, should be present. No withdrawing of blood into syringe, rap, uh, followed by rapid saline chase as uh, half-life of adenosine is only around 10 seconds and followed by a saline bolus of 5 ml for infant, 10 ml for child and 20 ml for adult. It can also be used in external jugular vein in case of children. Adenosine contains 1 ml, 3 mg. Maximum dose is 0.3 mg per kg. Uh, continuous monitoring should be done and when adenosine is given, keep ready defibrillation machine, injection adrenaline, injection aminophylline, IV atropine, oxygen and intubation set also. So for a 10 kg child, maximum dose is 3 mg. We can see in case of uh, SBT after giving adenosine, the rhythm is reverted back to sinus. Use a vagal maneuver in case of uh, SBT or carotid sinus massage. Here, the sawtooth type uh, tachycardia, that is atrial flatter, is manifested. And in case of uh, SBT, this is AVNRT. After the escape rhythm, the sinus rhythm is reverted back. So what are the causes of failure to respond to adenosine? It can be due to very slow push and adenosine is uh, deranged. After, uh, um, it can be other due to other non-responsive rhythms. Not enough saline flush is used. Heightened sympathetic stimulation. Uh, other drugs are IV amygdala. Bolus dose 3 to 5 mg per kg IV used over 10 to 20 minutes, followed by infusion of 10 mg per kg over 12 hours, followed by 5 mg per kg over 12 to 24 hours, depending on the response, and then switch to oral with 1 hour of overlap of IV and oral amidaron. Now, amidaron is class 3 anti arrhythmic drug. It is very versatile and most effective and safe uh, for congenital heart disease or heart failure, uh, heart failure uh, Child, almost all kind of SBT, AVRT, AVNRT, ectopic atrial tachycardia, atrial flatter, fibrillation, and VT respond to amygdala. But the caution uh, is uh, it causes hypothyroidism, interstitial lung disease, corneal deposit when it is used for long term. Other drugs used in SBT, a small oil, which is uh, 500 microgram per kg IV bolus, followed by <coughs> sorry, followed by uh, infusion. 50 to 200 microgram per kg per minute. And other drugs are verapamil, procainamide. Procainamide is used 10 to 15 mg per kg bolus in 30 minutes followed by infusion. A digoxin as single agent not effective. It is used as adjuvant. Beta blocker is very versatile and it can be used in any, uh, any type of SVT. SVT, uh, acute prophylaxis, ectopic, atrial tachycardia, CPVT, long QT, uh, any BT, beta blocker is uh, can be used. Now, one thing we should remember always as pediatrician, <coughs> IP Tamil is absolutely contraindicated in newborn, infant below 2 years, heart failure and wide QRS tachycardia. When DC uh, synchronized cardioversal uh, we, uh, we use in shock, hypertension, hemodynamically unstable babies, in cardiac decompensation, non-responsive children, and the dose is 0.5 to 1 joule per kg and conscious sedation with ketamine and midazolam anesthesia uh, and analgesia and sedation are used. For neonatal SVT, IV adenosine, IV amygdalon, clicanide are used. DCO cardioversal is uh, used but no vagal maneuver or no IV verapamil are used. Students in SVT which are not used in SVT, verapamil below 12 years, vagal maneuver in newborn, combination of beta blocker and uh, calcium channel blocker, Dioxin as single agent, dioxin and CCP in WPW syndrome. Now, SBT management data in NCBI 2000, according to NCBI 2015, number was 2,848. Uh, uh, in among CHD, it was 13%, recurrence in hospital was 
death was 2% and drugs used were adenosine, amiodarone, esmolol, ficanide and procalamide. Now, uh, after FT, every SVT conversion, pre and post SVT conversion ECG to be taken due to uh, uh, documentation of the underlying radium. When SVT occurs below one year, uh, we can use expectant or drug prophylaxis management one, one to five years expectant <coughs> drug prophylaxis or invasive management. Excuse me. For more than five years, uh, children, invasive management is needed uh, generally because more than five years, children, uh, if SVT occurs, it is likely to recur repeatedly if we don't use invasive management. What are the home care to prevent or detect recurrence? Adequate suppression for adequate suppression propanol due to 4 mg per kg and uh, mother is taught to detect by, by giving pulse oximeter and mother is uh, and mother is given a low cost stethoscope. Uh, so <clears throat> when mother cannot count the heart rate, it is told that it is SVT. So how long to give uh, the profile axis? <clears throat> one, year, one year from last episode, uh, taper slowly and look for breakthrough SVT. We have to monitor QTC, uh, when on sotalol amidarol and digoxin, you have to half dose the uh, digoxin with amidarol and half dose the thickenite with amidarol. In case of fetal SVT, primary gravida 28 weeks is just to self. Tachycardia of more than 200 per minute in fetus, fetal eco confirms SVT. Uh, no congenital heart disease, normal LVRB function, and no high drops. If the child is uh, near term, uh, fetus is near term, uh, pharmacological termination of uh, SVT, fetal photosynthesis amidarone are given, and the, if the uh, fetus is near term, induce labor and treat postnatally, it is better. So, what are the drugs fetal SVT? Uh, in fetal SVT, we, we can give digoxin, thickenide combination, or sotalol amidarone. Dijoxin dose is 250 microgram uh, twice daily for three days, followed by 500 microgram twice daily for three days. If no response, then add thickenide. If uh, SVT present with high drops or heart failure, then thickenide is the first dose. Uh, add dijoxin if required. It takes around five days uh, to reach sinus rhythm, and less than uh, one in less than one week, it 75% uh, reach sinus rhythm. Fliganite is only better than digoxin in converting SVT, but side effect profile is same. What are the common intervular narrow QS tachycardia, atrial fibrillation, uh, extremely rare in infants, such as flat or variable conduction, ectopic atrial tachycardia, or variable conduction, except above measure 3, uh, 3 majority of the tachycardia are regular. These 3 are irregular. Here we can see the sort of wave, the flatter waves. <coughs> Symptomatic, persistent, and recurrent uh, flatter in case of children. Uh, synchronized cardioversion is best uh, or catheter regulation for radio control and for uh, rate control, beta blocker or digoxin are used. In case of WPW syndrome, when uh, the impulse uh, goes anti-gradely uh, across the accessory pathway, it gives this white QRS, the pre excitation complex. So here we cannot give adenosine because adenosine will cause uh, AV block and the accessory path will, uh, will take upper hand and uh, the, the arrhythmia will, uh, the tachyrhythmia will increase. Here the treatment is catheter ablation, tokenamide, beta blocker and digoxin. One year old child, structurally normal heart, presented with lethargy, stable hemodynamics. Here is the ECG. Narrow keyword is tachycardia. Adenosine was given. After some escape beats, Sinus rhythm reverted. 15 years old boy, uh, history of palpitation, restlessness for last three days. Uh, pulse, uh, pulse was palpable, similar history two years back, but no document available. Uh, it was uh, wide QRS tachycardia, we can see. Uh, so our uh, different cell was uh, either BT or uh, ABNRT with aberrancy. After giving adenosine, we can see it reverted to sinus rhythm. So it was ABNRT with aberrancy. 12 year old child, fetal edema, fetal uh, facial puffiness for three days, breathing difficulty for one day came to emergency. We can see uh, the uh, narrow, uh, the tachycardia, which was uh, the QRS was around 120 millisecond, which was borderline for this child. 
hemodynamically unstable child it was quadri svt or vt pico structurally <coughs> normal heart with adenosine we can see the uh, the p immediately after the qrs which disappeared after the adenosine so uh, this p was retrograde p but the tachycardia uh, persisted so adenosine could not uh, convert the rhythm to sinus rhythm so it was vt it was diagnosed as vt and treated with iv reagent 1.5 year child hemodynamically stable heart rate to 80 in emergency with excessive cry we can see the white qrs tachycardia so our diagnosis was vt or svt with aberrancy or bundle branch block adenosine was given we can see sinus rhythm converted so it was svt with bundle branch block or aberrancy 20 days newborn referred for tachypnea on examination atherbral to 90 per minute heart rate regular paper pulse normal card, uh, in cvs there was cardiomegaly there was no murmur ecg narrow qrs tachycardia so it was avian atty so how we can diagnose the electro uh, how we can diagnose the underlying uh, rhythm abnormality or uh, the underlying pathway which we cannot diagnose by normal ecg we can do electrophysiology in ep lab to uh, identify and ablate this pathway extra accessory jo accessory pathway the locations are high ra around his bundle around coronary sinus uh, 3 4 catheters we use around coronary sinus and rb apical uh, catheter we can see the multiple uh, decapolar catheters and we ablate the uh, ablate by control heating around 70 to 80 degree centigrade and uh, it is ablated by radio frequency ablation but it is not easy invasive management uh, only used when we are uh, unable to control medically special points to remember in case of ep lab uh, many arrhythmia not take months or years if managed medically most arrhythmia should, should be induced in ep lab for good ablation end point many arrhythmia is not inducible under deep sedation or ga if we use deep sedation or ga arrhythmia is not inducible so but children need sedation or ga for any cat procedure no sense visit svt is will not resolve if persist beyond 6 years of age if possible so we need to wait after the child can cooperate with mild sedation or without sedation with this uh, ep procedure finally most will need ablation to avoid long term drug intake another uh, diagnostic procedure is ilr implantable loop recorder which can be used uh, subcutaneously it can be uh, kept up to 3 years for diagnosing the infrequent arrhythmias there are multiple devices uh, pacemaker icd implantable cardioverter defibrillator uh, which can be used for pt or long qt syndrome Uh, there is new axial modulation of uh, for ventricular tachycardia ventricular fibrillation for long qt syndrome cpvt denervation of lower stellate and upper thoracic sympathetic ganglia through uh, upper thoracic uh, pathway upper thoracic uh, thoracotomy there are multiple csds which are associated with arrhythmias st anomaly cctg heterotaxy syndrome asd common atrium illet vsd AV canal defect, TOF, DORB, TGA, and post intervention and post cardiac surgery. And there are many many arrhythmia syndromes inherited and channelopathies, which already discussed. And uh, why should we know PJRT? Uh, already discussed. The child is open in and out of SBT. It causes tachycardia induced cardiomyopathy. It is AVRT. And before giving IVIG, we should rule out always PJRT. Uh, and before uh, uh, referring a patient. Uh, of dcm for putting lv assist device or cardiac transplant we must uh, uh, exclude the patient uh, having pjrt because if it is there it will recur again precautions for long long qt syndrome patients long qt 1 they should not participate in swimming uh, it, it is dangerous 99% episodes during swimming or exercise emotions long qt 2 they should be given potassium oral potassium supplements or potassium sparing agents long qt 3 uh, these can, these should be given sodium channel blockers as possible adjuvants for long qt syndrome so beta blocker are the choice late cardiac sympathetic denervation can be done 
ideally performed by extraplural approach. Propanolol and nadolol are the most effective. For CPVT, uh, CPVT, uh, why this is discussed? Uh, because it is uh, common, onset is common between uh, 5 to 7 to 12 years of age. Episodic syncope during exercise or, or acute emotion. CPVT can be induced by exercise or emotion. This is Bruce protocol of exercise. Uh, and induced uh, CPVT. Plicanide can be used for primary prevention. Nadolol is the most effective treatment. And this is the cardiac arrest al algorithm, uh, which shows the ventricular tachycardia, ventricular fibrillation. Without pulse, we all know the pulse algorithm, uh, the shockable or non shockable rhythm. Uh, rhythm is shockable when BF or uh, pulse density is there. And asystole and pulseless electrical activity, CPR is used for by adrenaline. And for uh, VF and pulseless VT, we use CPR and shock. Thank you. Excellent presentation, Dr. Malovika. Uh, now we'll move on to our next topic, which is bradycardia and its management. And I would like to invite Dr. Shudipto Vatashaji for oh. this topic. Dr. Shudipto, he has... Devoprato, I... Devoprato? Yes. Uh, there is a small change. I think we can take one, two uh, questions here directly uh, because Malubika has ended with the well within the time and he has a few minutes left already. as was nice talk by Malubika after. And uh, welcome uh, Dr. Anil Singh sir, for uh, joining us with the today. Dr. Anil Singh is now expert of this uh, today's symposium. Uh, uh, welcome you, Dr. Anil Singh. Now, there are few questions in the chat box already. Many are uh, answered by Dr. Anil Singh. So one, uh, uh, I think uh, confusion was regarding the dose of uh, uh, adenosine. They, uh, one of the part delegates, Narayana, has asked the, how the 10 kg child, the dose is 3 mg. Uh, so they are confused that the maximum dose is 0.2 mg for adenosine. But in 10 kg child, you have showed probably 0.3 mg per kg. So maximum dose is coming 3 mg. But the maximum dose is 0.2 mg. I think the maximum dose is not 0.2 mg. That is their confusion. Can you uh, clarify that, Malubika? What is the maximum dose of adenosine and what is the usual dose we give for the first and the second dose? Uh, sir, uh, maximum dose is 6 mg for first dose. And uh, uh, and the maximum dose we can use for second and third dose 12 mg, sir. Uh, I, I think for pediatric, we, we should be very clear. The recommended doses are uh, 0.1 to 0.4. Starting dose 0.2 milligram per kg is a good dose. We can go up to 0.4 per kg. 6 milligram is an adult dose. So I just wish to highlight we should not give 6 milligram to a small child. Yes, sir. Yes, yes, sure, uh, for the sure. the pediatric age group, we should give 0.3. Somebody gives if he is very confident and expert that this is a bad tachycardia, it's okay. But 0.2 is a good dose to start. So 10 kilo child can get two. Next dose can be even three. And it, it so, should be freshly prepared. That is most important. So, Anil, the take-home message is 0.2 milligram per kg of body weight maximum. No, no, not maximum. No. Per dose, I am talking. I am talking about per dose. We can give two to three times. Yes, yes. yes ma maximum not... means first dose maximum, not 0.3, but 0.2. Uh, three milligram in 10 kg, we can give two milligram, usually works. Usually 100 micro, that is 0.1 milligram per kg, uh, may not work. But we can start as per protocol 0 0.1, 0 0.2, 0 0.3. These three dose in three helicots that also can be worked there is no fixed rule the road dose is is mentioned 0.1 to 0.4 milligram per kg that is what mentioned okay. yes i just wanted so, to uh, highlight that point okay thank you thank you <laughs> and the, another question uh, that unanswered is the how what is the mechanism of actual magnesium in wpw syndrome Long QT syndrome, sorry. How uh, magnesium, mechanism of magnesium in long QT syndrome. 
Dr. Anil Singhi, please answer. Malobika or Dr. Anil Singhi? Sir, next is used in case of BT. When the long QT syndrome has BT, it is only then used. Okay. The patient is unstable. Otherwise, long QT syndrome patient, if if it if the patient is stable, uh, no need to use magnesium, IV magnesium. Yes. Thank you. Uh, so another question, basic question: What are the shockable rhythms? So pulseless BT, uh, ventricular fibrillation, these are the shockable rhythms. And pulseless electrical activity, uh, this is not shockable. Uh, CPR should be used. Yes. So, uh, and uh, another question: How much maximum joule of DC shock can be used in intractable tachycardia? Maximum DC shock. One joule per kg. Dose is 0.5 to one joule per kg. Uh, so, one joule per kg uh, maximum dose is given. For uh, VF and VT, a pulseless VT. Pulseless for pulseless VC VT up to four joule per kg maximum dose. Yes. Yes. That is uh, that is asynchronized. Yes. And defibrillatory dose. Thank you. Thank you for clarification. I think there are no other questions left in the chat box, and there is a small change in the schedule uh, due to some emergency. Dr. Shanonda have to present her presentation now. Then after that, Dr. Sudipto will present. Uh, thank you, Dr. Sudip, for agreeing on that. I will uh, request uh, Devoproto to. Uh, introduce Dr. Shanonda and proceed. Hello, thank you. Thank you everyone for changing the schedule. Uh... Okay. Welcome Dr. Shanonda. So the topic for Shanonda today is uh, common ECG changes in PICU scenario and its management. So Dr. Shanonda, she has done her MD in pediatrics and then fellowship in pediatric critical care from St. John's Medical College, Bangalore and Great Ormond State Hospital, UK. And she has also pursued pediatric uh, cardiac critical care fellowship from Royal Brunton Hospital, UK. She's currently attached to Fortis Hospital, Kolkata as consultant pediatrician and pediatric intensivist. So over to you, Dr. Shanonda. Thank you. Uh, can, you can you all see my screen? Yes, please go to slideshow mode. Uh, we can see. Go to slideshow mm -hmm. mode. Uh, yeah. Yes, perfect. Yes. Yeah. So, uh, thank you all for such an intense session. And today I'm trying to make my presentation as simple and as less repetitive as possible. So, these are the common arrhythmia pattern that we have found in uh, PICU. So, uh, once we see an abnormal ECG, the, there are two categories, like whether it's too fast or too slow. So if it's too fast, then we try to analyze the rhythm, whether it's a QRS complex is narrow or the broad. So are the narrow complex or broad complex? Or um, uh, with that uh, narrow complex uh, uh, tachycardias, we usually get the supraventricular tachycardias and then broad complex are the ventricular tachyarrhythmia groups. So this is for the reference, like a normal um, ECG, PI uh, interval, QRS axis, age-wise. Uh, then, uh, so this is already all of you know. So this is the mechanism of supraventricular tachycardia. Either it could be automatic or a uh, intra uh, or a re-entry phenomena. So automatic means it is adrenaline dependent and they have a warm up and a cooling of time. And while the re-entry tachycardias, they usually like uh, on and off, start suddenly and then stops suddenly. So among the automatic sinus tachycardia is very common and then uh, interesting to know about ectopic atrial tachycardia and the re-entry, uh, usually atrial, uh, intra-atrial re-entry, fibrillation and flutter and AV node re-entry, which is AV nodal, AV re-entry, and PGRT. So uh, usually by SVT, we means in an infant or neonatal group, we usually find the AV NRT, and in older age group, it is AVRT. 
So here I will present a steep strip of ECG. So this is a five month old who has come with two days history of poor feet and shortness of breath. And as is the problem uh, with any problem in an infant, first thing that happens is poor feeding. So whenever there is poor feeding, we take it very seriously. So this is the ECG which has come. And as you can see, this comes in the algorithm of narrow complex. The QRS complex seems to be uh, narrow and the heart rate seems to be regular. But uh, heart rate here, if you see the RR interval, it will come around 200 to 220 uh, and above. So whenever in an infant we find uh, um, heart rate above 200 or 220, more specifically speaking. So it, this cannot be a sinus tachycardia, but like 99% sure. So uh, some uh, supraventricular tachycardia, um, uh, we can diagnose. And then uh, another uh, ECG I'll show you. Uh, so this is a seven year old who has come with a, a dizziness and uh, some blackout. Um, like feeling and this is recurrent uh, symptom and once we have done an ECG we have found a, a pretty regular uh, QRS complex and rates to be around 70s but if you look at the QRS complex closely so you can see an upsliding of the QRS which is the pre-excitation and this is actually the WPW uh, ECG pattern so WPW as itself it doesn't cause any symptoms but uh, there is if you take history in more detail, um, uh, there will be some uh, palpitation, feelings of palpitation, which is, will be complained by the child. And uh, uh, this is the SPT, which is caused by the WPW that will uh, uh, cause the symptoms. Then there is this 10 week old baby who has come for a, a vaccination and routine check and on examination has got a very irregular and fast heart rate. And uh, this is the ECG which looks like very chaotic. And if you look at the RN intervals, like somewhere here, the uh, heart rate looks like it is around uh, 200. But if you look at this side, this is 132, 150. So pretty irregular heart rate and uh, uh, can't really see there's a P wave. In some uh, strips, we can find a query there's a P. And in some other strips, we cannot really figure out whether there's a P wave or not. So what to do? This is a tricky situation. And what to do in these situations? So what we have given is, we have given 100 microgram per kilo adenosine. So this is not to treat the arrhythmia. We have used it like uh, to block the AV node and unmask the um, uh, P waves. So this is what we have got after the adenosine. So here we can see that uh, we have got uh, for one QRS, we have got more than one P. So this is P, then again QRS, P, P. So P and QRS, they are completely different and uh, they have separate rhythms and activity. So this is actually a atrial ectopic tachycardia. So this is adenosine here is used as being a diagnostic tool and not to treat the tachycardia. Um, and then uh, the same type of ECG, we get another baby, newborn baby with no antenatal care, come with poor perfusion and edema, poor feeding. And then um, the, we can see this is also a narrow complex tachycardia. And the, if we look at the morphology of P waves very closely, uh, there's a, a a sawtooth like uh, P wave and constant P wave activity pre present. So, uh, in contrast to the atrial ectopic tachycardia, there is no break in between the P waves. So, this is an actually atrial flutter, which is not very uncommon in the neonatal age group. And um, usually, when it is present, it it has has been going on since in the uh, intrauterine phase. So, the children they cannot complain of palpitation or any feeling. So, this is going on for quite some time and affecting the cardiac function and perfusion. So when they present to you in the ER, uh, they are actually quite sick. Okay, so what are the treatment of this supraventricular tachycardia? So uh, first question is, what is the rhythm? Second is, what is the antiarrhythmic? But uh, this is not actually the second question. So more important question is how long and how urgent is the treatment? So how long the um, arrhythmia has been going on and how sick is the child? So whether there is evidence of shock, whether the child is well looking, how long in the supraventricular tachycardia, if there is any underlying cardiac condition or congenital heart disease. So all of these will guide our treatment. 
and basically uh, in APLS, uh, we have a, a detailed uh, coverage of the treatment of all the supraventricular tachycardias. So uh, uh, mainly we have to assess the hemodynamic status of the infant or the child. If the child is not in shock, uh, perfusion well, then we might try some vagal maneuvers and adenosine 100 microgram per kilo later on. And uh, But if the child is not in uh, hemodynamically stable state, then there is uh, no point uh, wasting time doing vagal maneuvers. So we'll go directly first, we'll start um, adenosine and uh, see, uh, with uh, 100 microgram per kilo dose we start and then sequentially with each dose, if, if the uh, SBT is not getting corrected, we sequentially increase the dose to 200, 300 and then 400 to 500. Usually what I have seen that uh, when the child needs 400 to 500 microgram dose of uh, adenosine, the child already becomes a uh, hypotensive and uh, um, requires uh, cardiovascular support. So um, that is the point uh, we should consider uh, managing uh, start ionotrope and managing the uh, hemodynamic status as well. So, and if a uh, child presents with in uh, uh, completely in shock and not hemodynamically stable, so straight ahead we go to synchronized DC shock. And the dose here is one joule per kg, which is uh, very less than the dose of your defibrillation dose. Uh, now, um, what do we mean by vagal maneuver? And it's very important because if in a stable neonet, we just, we don't go on giving them DC shocks. We'll try the vagal maneuver and they're as useful as uh, DC shock or adenosine to stop our SBT. So um, usually ice pack on the face or uh, in older children, we can try asking them to do a Valsalva if they are understanding. But ice pack on the face of the neonet, uh, it's a very useful vagal technique. And how we are going to keep the ice pack, that is also important. Uh, so this is a short video for your interest. Just... So this is not how we should do a face pack, uh, ice pack on the face. So ideally, there should be a pack full of uh, ice blocks and we fill the bag with water. And then um, this is very uncomfortable. So we should apologize to the parent or the bystander about it and place uh, the pack on the neonate's face very gently for 10 to 15 seconds at a time. And so that the face actually conforms to the ice pack and it is actually very effective way so my uh, next slide is uh, so the main point of treating the svt is to uh, remain in normal sinus rhythm and adenosine is actually stops the uh, svt but it doesn't keep you out of that svt for a long time so we have to add some maintenance uh, drugs and at this point, we should contact our pediatric cardiologist friends. And beta blocker usually is a good first line for infant propranolol, older children, atronolol. And sometimes um, children who are unstable, they might need IV treatment with esmolol. So before starting the IV beta blocker infusion, we should confirm that the cardiac reserve and the cardiac function is good. Otherwise, digoxin is a uh, quite safe choice. So we can start amiodron infusion, but amiodron also can cause hypotension. So the child has to be supported hemodynamically as well. So these are the narrow complex tachycardias. Now I come to broad complex tachyarrhythmias. So um, these are the most common broad complex tachyarrhythmias we find. So uh, ventricular tachycardia, ventricular fibrillation, or rather I would say uh, supraventricular with aberrancy or sinus tachy with right bundle branch block, SVT with right bundle branch block, these are more common. So the um, uh, narrow complex with the aberrancy or uh, bundle branch block are the more common uh, type of broad complex tachyarrhythmia we find in ICU setting compared to VF and PT. Now, history is very important here. 
any family history of sudden cardiac death any past cardiac surgery or any past ecgs which document any wpw type of pattern and also there there is a um, possibility of accidental ingestion of medication so what are the medicines uh, which uh, is available at that point in the house that is also that history is important so now uh, looking at this uh, ecg this is a 13 year old girl who has present with intermittent history of palpitation so um, if we look at the morphology this is a regular heart plate and the morphology of the qrs complex is uh, quite stable and uh, it's a broad complex but the uh, patient has a palpable pulse and hemodynamically the patient is stable and if you look at v1 there is a uh, right panel branch block pattern also in the ecg so this is a stable type of ventricular tachycardia um, which we call the fascicular type of ventricular tachycardia the patient is stable so we don't need to uh, defibrillate this patient at this instance but we should in patient admit this patient observe um, uh, to a halter monitoring call our periodic cardiology uh, friends and usually uh, uh, they uh, beta blocker is the uh, uh, most commonly used treatment uh, which is used to treat this type of uh, stable ventricular tachycardia but on the other hand if you look at uh, this one so this is also white complex tachycardia and it is quite chaotic and probably if you see this type of uh, ecg the patient is not going to come to you and say that they are having palpitation or dizziness so this is actually a uh, cardiac arrest situation uh, type of ecg when you get it so this is our ventricular fibrillation and um, we will manage it as per the apls guidelines for ventricular fibrillation which is this so we start with uh, uh, starting cpr and then shock start with 4 joule per kilo shock dose which is a defibrillation dose and continue cpr adrenaline and continue till the return of uh, ROSC or spontaneous circulation or until uh, unfortunately the patient passes away then uh, until then we have to continue this cycle and uh, this is of interest so if you see this ecg another one uh, this is also a broad complex qrs but if you look at the qrs morphology we are finding two types of qrs complex so this is a uh, catecholaminergic polymorphic vt and this is the most common pattern of vt uh, that is found in patients with uh, in second decade of life uh, or who has sudden cardiac death so uh, maybe the first presentation with this sort of ecg is sudden cardiac death so uh, we have to be very very careful if we find uh, this type of ecg strip in a patient and the patient is still talking to us and uh, this patient should be admitted and evaluated now the slow um, rhythms so slow heart rates either uh, there is problem in the sinus sinus bradycardia or there is problem in the av node conduction pathway so uh, sinus bradycardia could be physiological which is most common and increased vagal tone and of certain medications which slows down the av conduction activity now um, one thing of importance in the icu so once we get a, a patient who has a central nervous system pathology so there is something called a cushing's reflex uh, which which is uh, it's a triad of bradycardia hypertension and uh, pupillary abnormalities so this is usually quite extreme already we have the background of either a head trauma or a neural surgery or a head tumor and uh, uh, this is um, signifies this type of sinus bradycardia actually signifies raised intracranial pressure and then uh, the coming to av node uh, we have first degree second degree block that first degree block is just prolongation of pr interval second degree uh, block which is called mobitz type 1 it is uh, a gradual like variable pr intervals then mobitz type 2 uh, where the pr interval subsequently gets prolonged and then there is one drop bit and third degree then third degree every block there is completely uh, atrioventricular asynchrony and uh, p and qrs are independent of each other and uh, while evaluating the slow rhythms history of congenital heart disease or cardiac surgery is very important and we, another important question is is there is any chronotropic competence like the heart rate how slow it is and whether the slow heart rate is uh, 
matching the physiological heart rate or this is very far away from the physiological heart rate so there's an interesting mnemonic for all the heart blocks which is this uh so Danola, you have uh, four minutes left okay i'm almost done uh, so uh, this is a three-year-old and with this ecg pattern and if you can see the look at the pr interval you can see p's and not all the p's are following all the q's and uh, but the pr interval is also uh, variable so this is a mobit type 2 and if you look at the heart rate uh, this is almost 70 uh, to 80 so child needs evaluation but we are not going to insert a pacemaker right away while if you look at this ecg this is the same uh, movie type 2 but the heart rate is around 40 so right away this child might need a pacemaker insertion so this is a summary uh while we uh, get the uh, uh, abnormal rhythm first recognize the rhythm then assess the patient condition how quickly we need to act if there is narrow complex usually we classify as supraventricular and adenosine either therapeutic or uncover the rhythm then beta blocker to, for the short-term treatment and if it's broad complex then child is likely to be much sicker but not always and always we have to conduct the pediatric cardiology for uh, their expert opinion when there is bradycardias these are uh, much less likely to cause symptoms and uh, then AV node dysfunction and symptomatic then it is important and uh, sinus bradycardias are also very common and in the neurological uh, pathology we have to keep in mind the possibility of raised intracranial pressure so that's all thank you everyone uh, we can take some questions yeah thank you dr shalanda so there are some questions in the chat box so you can just answer them, Shalanda. I'll just... Uh, 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 the 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 answered by Dr. Singh, sir. Uh, you can pick up the question. And, uh, yes. So one question is, uh, what is the difference between synchronized and unsynchronized shock? and their therapeutic indication and implications. Dr. Shananda? So uh, synchronized means uh, the, when, we, we, when we are discharging the shock, uh, it is at the beginning of the uh, Q, QRS complex. And um, usually, um, and the desynchronized is, uh, it, it doesn't depend on the, uh, it, it doesn't have any relation to the cardiac cycle, which part of the cycle we are delivering the shock. So usually VF, uh, unstable VT or VF, we use asynchronized or desynchronized shock and synchronized uh, we use in the SBT. Okay, thank you. Uh, I think we have another, we can take another question. So next question is what vagal maneuvers is used in infantile SBT? And uh, can ice pack induced uh, cardiac standstill in infantile? SVT? No, 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 yeah. no. I haven't experienced any cardiac standstill with ice pack. So ice what, packs are what actually very effective. What use in infantile SVTs? In 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 infants, the ice pack is the best thing. Uh, ice with water actually is a packet full of ice mixed with water and just gently put on the infant's face. So this is quite effective, 10 to 15 seconds if we pull like that. Or otherwise, uh, start with that. If it is not helping, then uh, straight ahead, go, go ahead with agnosin. So uh, put an IV line which is closest to the heart. And if you don't have a central line, uh, then uh, I think anti-cubital fossa put a line and then uh, put a three-way and like uh, simul uh, like uh, subsequently you give adenosine and then the flush uh, very rapidly. And that is quite effective. So I think the expert is deviating uh, to some extent. So Anil, uh, will you want to uh, speak? Hello. Uh, uh, I spec uh, what uh, she told is the standard teaching, but on practicality, it is little tricky to use getting that immediately uh, in our scenario. So if we have an infant with VT, this uh, SVT, possibly it's good to have securing line and giving adenosine. Yes. Uh, that is the practicality. We yes. cannot 
Teletel take something from UK because they have a different system. They are more uh, expert people immediately ready. Ice pack, all those soft things. It should be very soft. Baby should be handled in a way. Reverse ice pack on that. So those things securing airway at that time is difficult. So unless the team is completely trained and geared up for ice pack and we are suggesting ice pack in our scenario, it may be counterproductive. So to our scenario, though theoretically it is inducing vagal stimulation, but our side uh, adenosine will be the good thing to start with. And it is majority of the cases very, very rewarding. I'm just trying to be very practical. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. I completely agree with you. Thank you. I think Dr. Sopon, you wanted, I think, uh, just uh, wanted to have some message to the, our uh, great learners when they are themselves attending a sick baby. It's very stressful. In our scenario, having an SBT infant is extremely stressful because child will be irritable, crying, and parents will be around creating... 10 times adrenaline spike to the doctors. Yes. So we should be very, very careful. Exactly. exactly. So I think no more question over there, Dr. Devabrata. Yes. So I think Yali Singh sir has already answered a few of the questions here. So I think we can uh, One go question. for next topic. Uh, so One question unsynchronized just to tell the, why our way, if we don't give uh, the shock synchronized to R, the the wave will fall on T and it will convert it in fibrillation and fibrillation. Why? It's an R and T phenomenon. R and T phenomenon. So that we should target the shock synchronized with R. We don't want it to fall accidentally even on T. So you will be putting the signal in wrong time. So the, the whole of the rhythm will get Geopardized child will have a more disastrous consequences. This is I'm just answering that question. Now you 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 take over. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you, Thank you Anand Singh sir. So I think I'm not finding any more questions over here. So I think I'll just move on to the next session. So this is the topic is the bradycardia and its management by Dr. Shudipto Bhattacharji. So Dr. Shudipto, he has done his MD in pediatrics and DNB pediatrics, and then uh, FNB in pediatric cardiology from Triple M Chennai. And he's currently working as a consultant pediatric cardiologist at uh, the Mission Hospital Durgapur. He has uh, several publications and also participated in different national and international conferences. So over to uh, Dr. Shudipto. Uh, uh, are my slides visible? I think, I suppose it, they are visible. Hello? Yes, yes. Yes, you can see yes. the slides. Yeah, uh, thank you, Dr. Devabrato, for the kind introduction and a very good evening to all. So, uh, my topic is bradycardia in children, approach and management. So, as you all know, bradycardia is defined as a heart rate measured in the awake state, which is below the normal range for the age of the child. As you know, uh, the, the approximate normal resting heart rates in the pediatric population, they tend to decrease with increase in the age. So it is very difficult to define a particular heart rate for uh, defining bradycardia. And the bradycardia should be defined based on the age of the uh, patient, uh, age of the child, and the normal values of the resting heart rate for that child. So bradycardia can be caused by intrinsic dysfunction or injury to the heart's conduction system or by extrinsic factors acting on a normal heart and its conduction system. So the physiology, we all know the heart rate is controlled by both the cardiac conduction system and the nervous system. I don't go into the details of the conduction system because we all know that. However, I just want to uh, 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 put the importance on the fact that only if the whole of the conduction system, starting from the sinus node to the right and the left bundle band, if the conduction, if the whole system is intact, then only there is some simultaneous contraction of the right and the left ventricles generating a normal narrow QRS. However, in any part of this conduction system, if there is any abnormality or any uh, 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 disruption, then it results in either prolonging of the conduction resulting in bradycardia. 
So the physiology involves uh, the nervous system, both the parasympathetic and the sympathetic nervous system innervate the cardiac conduction system. And the increased parasympathetic tone causes a decrease in heart rate, while the increased, parasymp increased sympathetic tone leads to an increase in the heart rate. So there are two main mechanisms and sites for the development of bradycardia. The first one is sinus bradycardia, which acts at the level of the sinus node and uh, influences the depolarization rate. And the next is the AV node block, which acts as the level of the AV node and below it and causes a delay or block of conduction of electrical impulse. Etiology, intrinsic causes include structural congenital heart diseases, irritable arrhythmia syndromes, collagen vascular diseases, surgical uh, trauma or uh, trauma caused by catheter procedures such as device closures and uh, diagnostic cath procedures. And extrinsic causes include medications such as beta blockers, calcium channel blockers, hypothermia, elevated intracranial pressure and hypervagotemia or neurally mediated syncope. So clinical presentation usually uh, very rarely bradycardia presents uh, with uh, um, uh, cardiorespiratory compromise and uh, instability. However, if uh, in case of very uh, in patients with very severe bradycardia and hemodynamic compromise, there might be poor systemic perfusion, shock, and ultimately cardiorespiratory arrest, and require immediate cardiopulmonary resuscitation. In stable patient, if there is milder degree of bradycardia, they are most commonly asymptomatic. And symptoms differ based on the age of the patient. In infants and young children, there is non-specific symptoms of poor feeling and lethargy. Sometimes syn syncope and seizure-like episodes may be present. In older children, they may present with uh, 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 exercise intolerance, sometimes chest pain, sometimes easy fatigability. All this uh, might be present. So evaluation, in case of an unstable child uh, with uh, signs of poor perfusion, immediate medical management should be short, uh, sought and additional evaluation and testing should be left for a later time. Whereas those children, stable children with bradycardia, comprehensive history and physical examination as well as ECG should be done to perform the, uh, to uh, identify the type of conduction abnormality. History includes history of exposure to medications, family history of syncope, history of cardiac disease, as well as uh, the uh, maternal history uh, of uh, connective tissue disorders, etc. Physical examination and irregular pulse or heartbeat might suggest the possibility of sinus node dysfunction or a second degree AV block. JBP cannon wave might be present, which may suggest a complete heart block. Abnormal heart sounds such as variable intensity of the first heart sound may be a, a sign of a complete heart block. Heart murmur or gallop breathing may suggest underlying congenital heart disease. So, as you all know, ECG is the first line for evaluation of a, a bradycardia. However, sometimes if the bradycardia is not continuous and is very intermittent, it might be missed on the normal ECG. So in that cases, we require ambulatory ECG monitoring or alter monitoring. It might be in, uh, indicated in evaluation of second or third degree AP block or to evaluate the physiological heart rate response in patients with syncope or near syncope where uh, bradycardia or sinus node dysfunction is uh, uh, suspected or in case of evaluation of metabolic conditions and uh, genetic conditions. So the Halter monitor, as we can see from this picture, it has adhesive electrodes and a monitor and that is a small uh, uh, lightweight battery operated digital recorder, which records two or three channels of ECG data and can give the minimum average and maximum heart rate as well as the longest pause in heart rate and uh, evidence of uh, tachycardia or uh, supraventricular or ventricular tachycardia. Other ECG monitors which can be used in, include uh, cardiac event recorders, wearable pa patches, insertable cardiac monitors, and smartphone-induced uh, uh, inserted uh, recorders. ECO is also suggested for evaluation and is used to uh, identify structural abnormalities as well as function. They may, used, they may be used to pro assess the progressive ventricular enlargement and function in children with 
chronic bradycardia and also for the evaluation of children with synco and abnormal ECG findings or positive family history. Exercise stress testing uh, is usually performed in more than seven years of age and is used to determine the heart rate response with activity, that is the chronotropic competence. So usually with activity, the heart rate increases and the increase is there is a specific uh, like the increase of the heart rate has a relation with the amount of activity and this if this is present that is the there is chronotrop chronotropic competence is present then it is a, a positive sign and a good prognostic factor during evaluation of uh, bradycardia However, if there is chronotropic incompetence, and that is the inability to appropriately respond to stress, it may be an indicator of permanent pacemaker therapy. Laboratory evaluation, if indicated, might involve drug screening, thyroid function test, and other tests as shown. So identifying the type of breathing abnormality. First is uh, sinus bradycardia. So this is a uh, bradycardia with rhythm originating from the SNL. So the P wave axis is normal and that is a upright P wave in the lead one and AVF. And each P wave is followed by a narrow QRS complex or normal QRS complex. And it may be associated with uh, sinus node dysfunction and for present with sinus pause or arrest. So etiology we have already told in during the general etiology for bradycardia. So we can see here, so this is a sinus bradycardia in a two year old girl. Although we see that the heart rate is somewhere between 60 to 70, that is normal for an adult patient. However, for a two-year-old girl, this rate is less than normal for her age. So here in a five-year-old boy, here also the heart rate is less than 60 per minute. And the, this is a sinus rhythm. The P wave is upright in one and AVF and is followed by a QRS pump. So majority of patients with sinus bradycardia are asymptomatic. If they are symptomatic, they should be promptly evaluated. And in simple office practice, which we can do is we can ask the child to do some mild exercise, such as a jumping jack, and document an increase in the sinus rate, which shows that the normal sinus node function is present. And that might be reassuring for both the parents as well as the physician. However, in case of severe sinus bradycardia with hemodynamic instability, sympathetomimetics drugs such as atropine or isoprenadine might be required or transcutaneous pacing might be used. So sinus dose node dysfunction is an abnormality of impulse generation and propagation from the sinus node, usually caused in children by direct injury or disruption of blood supply to the node from PBS surgery. It is usually uncommon in the pediatric age group. And the ECG shows sinus bradycardia with slow except escape rhythms. Sometimes sinus node pause or arrest may be present. And sometimes tachycardia or bradycardia syndrome, such as that is severe sinus bradycardia followed by tachycardia in the form of atrial reentrant tachycardia, such as atrial flutter in children or fibrillation in adults might be present. So one important point is there is inappropriate sinus bradycardia or chronotropic incompetence in this group while well compared to normal sinus bradycardia. So there are uh, etiology, it consists of non-reversible causes and reversible. So non-reversible causes mainly in, involves surgical uh, congenital heart diseases. It might be due to the heart disease itself or in post-operative, such as in heterotaxy syndrome, it might be present as a result of the heart disease or in case of uh, atrial uh, switch surgery or a fontan surgery for TGA or single ventricle physiology or for surgery for AV canal defects, then also it might cause uh, sinus node dysfunction. Other causes are channelopathies, cardiomyopathies, and myocarditis, inflammatory causes, tumor, and autoimmune causes might be present. So here you can see there is some sinus pause and some bradycardia is present and the RR interval is irregular. But we can see that all the, the P wave is preceding the QRS complex always. Okay, so, so this shows sinus pause and here is, this shows sinus arrest where the, the, there, is a, uh, the, there is no P wave for a long time, it's more than six seconds. So if the, the, the P wave does not come for more than three seconds, it's, it, it implies sinus arrest. So if symptomatic sinus node dysfunction is present, then implantation of a permanent pacemaker is suggested. 
So here, this is another uh, patient with a, a sinus node dysfunction who has developed a junctional escape rhythm. So this rhythm originates from junction. There is no PUA visible and a normal narrow PORS complex. And here, this is a bradycardia, tachycardia syndrome. So runs of uh, sinus pause and arrest followed by tachycardia. So did, next is disorders of AV conduction, that is AV block. So it is categorized into first degree, second degree, and third degree or complete AV block. So first degree AV block is uh, defined as a delay in the atrioventricular conduction. Or it should be more correct terminology would be a prolonged PR interval. And it is usually, it does not cause any bradycardia or any hemodynamic instability and has a benign course. However, if the uh, PR interval is more than 300 millisecond, or in those where the PR interval does not shorten with increasing heart rate, should be evaluated for an underlying cause. So the causes is similar to sinus bradycardia. In congenital heart disease such as Epstein's anomaly or ASD or AVSD, it might be noted. So here you can see this is the P wave and this is the QRS complex, and there is a uh, PR interval is almost like more than 350 to 400 milliseconds. So it's a first degree heart block. Second degree AV block, there, are, it, uh, there is failure of at least one non-premature atrial impulse to contact to the ventricles. It is classified into different types. So first is Mobis type 1 or Wenke back phenomenon. It is the most common type of second degree AV block where there is progressive prolongation of the PR interval until a PY fails to be conducted. It is generally transient in nature and caused by increased vagal influence. May be seen normally in children and young adults during sleep or in well-trained athletes. Patients <coughs> with intrinsic AV nodal disease might also have this type of uh, block, but usually it is generally asymptomatic. And you can see here in this ECG, there is a... Uh, you can see the PR interval is progressively increasing, and finally, one uh, P is not conducting. So, Mobis type 2 is characterized by abrupt loss of conduction without previous change in PR interval. So, it is much less frequent than type 1, but it should always be considered pathologic. So, it has a more prognostic significance, and it may progress to complete heart block. So the most common reason is uh, in pediatrics is myocarditis or a post-surgical or transcatheter complication. So here you can see the P wave is coming and then uh, the P wave is followed by the QRS complex with normal PR interval. And then the P wave is not, it's blocked and there is no conduction to give a QRS complex. So this type of block would be better called a four is to three AV block because Four waves are conduct. Four P waves are conducted. Where, uh, three P waves are conducted, where one is not conducted out of four waves. So another types are a two is to one AB block, where the the alternate P wave is conducting, and it is impossible to classify it as either type one or two because there is no stable PN interval. And third is a high grade or advanced second degree AB block when there are two or more successive atrial impulses that are not propagated to the AV node. Such, and show the examples. So this is a two is to one AV block. Here we can see that there is one PO which is conducted and the PO which is not conducted, again followed by one PO which is conducted. So this is a two is to one AV block. And here, this is a, a high grade AV block where more than two, uh, like more than one P wave are not conducted. So here we can see one, two, uh, and here one. So three P waves are not conducted while one P wave is conducted. So you, you can tell it is a four is to one AV block. So the next is complete AV block or third degree AV block, which is the complete failure of the sinus atrial impulses to conduct to the ventricles. And here the atrial rate must be faster than the ventricular rate. And there will no, there will not be any relation between the P wave and the QRS complex. Majority of the affected pediatric patients having complete AV block fall into three groups. One is structural cardiac disease, one is maternal connective tissue disorders, and third is complications from a cardiovascular surgery or catheter intervention. The other causes may be infection, myopathies, uh, or genetic disorders, as already mentioned. 
So here, this is a complete AV block. As you can see, so these are the P waves. The arrow marks the P waves and the QRS. So the QRS, so the RN interval is more or less, uh, they are regular. And the PP interval are also more or less regular. However, the PR intervals are continuously varying. So it shows that the, and the number of P waves is more than the number of RO, QRS complexes. So another example. So structural cardiac disorders, uh, most common uh, uh, disorders associated include AV uh, septal defects and CCTG or AVBA discordance. And in case of maternal connective tissue or autoimmune disease, that is a congenital uh, complete heart block, uh, the maternal antibodies cross the placenta and affect the conduction system of the developing fetus. And in 50% of the cases, the mothers are diagnosed with some sort of connective tissue disorders. However, 50% of the mothers have no uh, uh, history or no evidence of any autoimmune disease or connective tissue disorders. And this high uh, propensity of congenital heart block to, uh, uh, to be associated with presence of anti-Rho or anti-LA, that is anti-SSA and anti-SSB antibodies in the mother. And from surgical and catheter integration, the most common surgeries involved in, include repair of a perimembranous VSD or AV canal defect or CCTG with VSD. And in case of aortic and mitral valve replacements, while in case of electrophysiology procedures or percutaneous catheter in, interventions, which uh, might result in impeachment of the device, such as the septal occluder or the uh, transcatheter valve on the AV node, this might be caused. And, in case of catheter interventions or devices, if we if these are usually dependent on the device, if we remove the device, then the block might go away. In case of surgical, usually these blocks are most of the time they are temporary, but however, there is an increased long time risk for developing AV block in future. So the symptoms in case of congenital AV block, there is uh, characterized by exceptionally high mortality rates in the infants and fetuses, more so in those associated with structural cardiac lesions. And it may result in no effect on uh, the fetus to hydrops fetalis and a prudent referral to a center with expertise in high risk ob obstetrics, fetal cardiology and pediatric and neonatal pacemaker implantation should be considered. In case of structurally normal hearts with uh, complete AV block. Those patients who have a reasonable junctional escape breathing, which is chronotropically competent, tend to be relatively asymptomatic. However, those with very slow resting heart rates that do not significantly increase with exercise, they uh, might require uh, maker implantation in the future. So they should undergo, all these patients who are asymptomatic with complete heart blocks should undergo a 24-hour halter monitor to detect some abnormalities such as abnormal pauses, uh, the average heart rate, complex ventricular ectopy or a wide QRS escape breathing or ventricular tachycardia. They can undergo exercise stress test which might uh, uh, uncover uh, symptoms or an increase in ventricular ectopy or an episode of VT and EPO, which is indicated to see the cardiac structure and function. So the approach to function, so first we have approach to management. So we have to uh, manage depending on the uh, type of symptom. A child who present acutely with poor perfusion require immediate medical management and those with non-life-threatening symptoms, the management depends on the frequency, severity of symptoms, and the effect it has on the heart, the specific type of conduction abnormality and whether a congenital heart disease is associated. So acute management of patients with poor perfusion, the AHA guidelines for CPR for children with bradycardia and poor perfusion and pulse, that is the pulse guideline may be followed. So first is airway management, oxygenation, ventilation, chest compression, and medicine to increase the heart rate. Epinephrine may be used for patients with increased vagal without increased vagal tone or primary AV block and atropine for patients with increased vagal tone or primary AV block. And potential reversible causes for refractory bradycardia such as hypoxemia, uh, hypothermia, head injury, toxins, hypervagotonia should be identified and treated. And if still bradycardia pers persists, temporary pacing followed by permanent pacemaker might be considered. 
So this is the algorithm. And I will not go into the details because already it is discussed. And in case it progresses to a cardiac arrest with a non-palpable uh, pulse, then we can uh, go to the pediatric cardiac arrest algorithm. So chronic management, permanent pacemaker implantation is the treatment of choice because chronic medical therapy is not effective and it has high side effect profile. In case of complete heart block, the definite therapy is usually permanent pacemaker implantation. In case of sinus node dysfunction also, the need for permanent pacing uh, depends on the uh, correlation of bradycardia with symptoms. In case of congenital heart dis uh, disease with uh, clinically significant bradycardia, uh, permanent pacemaker implantation is, uh, is should always be considered even in the absence of associated symptoms because these children have a high chance of heart failure, hemodynamic compromise, and increased re risk of sudden cardiac death. But children who are asymptomatic and do not have clinically significant bradycardia and without any cardiac uh, congenital cardiac disease, the treatment is just falling up. There is no uh, pacemaker implantation or uh, regular medication is required. So for post-surgical AB block, uh, temporary uh, pacing wires are uh, uh, usually after uh, open heart surgery, the surgeons put pacing wires and which uh, are uh, taken out of the uh, thorax uh, and placed outside and they can be paced temporarily in the immediate post-operative phase in case of post-surgical AB block. And they should be evaluated daily for return of native conduction. If it does not return within seven days, then a permanent pacing implantation is suggested. And temporary pacing for a hemodynamically significant AV block in the uh, office, in the OPD or emergency practice might involve transcutaneous pacing by means of defibrillator pads as shown and some temporary pacing catheters, which might be uh, used uh, to uh, uh, insert through the uh, either the femoral vein or the jugular. So pacemakers, uh, I think uh, we'll not go into the details. Just that the pacemakers are the the the, the final uh, answer to a complete heart block is a permanent pacemaker implantation, and they usually consist of generator which contains the battery, the circuitry, and computer, and a lead that connects the generator to the myocardium. They might be uh, the leads might be placed transvenous with a sub uh, <coughs> uh, uh, with a subclavian pocket, or they might be the the affixed to the outer surface of the heart by the surgeon that is called epicardial leads with the pacemaker pulse generator placed in the abdomen. So newer technology has uh, included the entire pacemaker circuit in a small device capsule that may be placed directly into the ventricle, which is called a leadless pacemaker. So here we can see, so this is a pacemaker, a permanent pacemaker. This is the pacemaker generator, impulse generator, and these are the leads, which are usually if uh, it may be a double lead or a single lead uh, pacemaker with uh, the lead space in either the uh, atrian, both the atrian ventricle and only the ventricle. So here, this is an example of a endocardial pacemaking, a pacemaker insertion, where the uh, where the pacemaker is uh, put uh, is implanted in a subclavian pocket, and this is an epicardial pacemaker implantation with the um, pacemaker uh, inserted in a uh, sub uh, in an abdominal pocket. So the indications have already been told through and again. So, so think, most important. Uh... Sir, uh, this is the last slide. Okay. Uh, it's over, I think. I'll not go much into the details. Uh, my talk is finished. Just uh, class one recommendations, I'll just tell. So in case of advanced second or third degree AV block associated with symptomatic bradycardia or ventricular dysfunction or low cardiac output, and in case of sinus node dysfunction with correlation of symptoms during age inappropriate bradycardia, uh, then post-operative advanced second or third degree AB block that is not expected to resolve or that persists at least seven days after cardiac surgery. Congenital third degree AB block with a white QRS escape breathing or a complex ventricular ectopy or ventricular dysfunction. And congenital third degree AB block in the infant with a ventricular rate of less than 55 beats per minute without any congenital heart disease or with congenital heart disease and a ventricular rate of less than 70 beats per minute. The other, there are numerous indications, but I think these are the five which we should always remember. Uh, I hope I could throw some light on the subject. Thank you.
So excellent presentation, Dr. Shudipto. Uh, so I think there is a question in the chat box is, what is the ideal age of a permanent pacemaker in congenital heart block? And I think Dr. Alin Singhi has already answered that. There is again another question. How frequently you have to change the lead of the pacemaker in a growing child? No. Like, uh, so this question see, it all depends how actually you... after, uh, yeah. Uh, you, did you get the question, Shudipto? Huh? Hello? Uh, did you get the question? So it's how yeah, frequently yeah. you have to change lead of the pacemaker in a growing child. I, I think what uh, the person is, uh, what the delegate is trying to uh, uh, trying to ask is how frequently do we change the uh, generator, I think, pacemaker generator. Because lead usually yes. uh, in, in children, we put leads in such a way that with growth, the leads are usually in a coiled form. So with growth, with growth of the child, when the cardiac size also grows, the, the lead should uncoil. Unless and until there is some lead, there is some problem with the lead, we don't usually don't lead, need to change the lead. But the pacemaker uh, generator, which is suppose the battery of the pacemaker, which is placed in the subclavian pocket, we have to, from time and again, we have to interrogate and find out the uh, amount of uh, longevity which is the amount of years. So that is called pacemaker interrogation. We find the longevity and depending on the longevity, we can de de determine that uh, how frequent, for example, if sometimes we see that uh, the pacemaker, the child sometimes even after insertion of the pacemaker, the child's original rhythm comes back. And then the child is not pacemaker dependent at all. So the pacemaker is on a standby mode. And then the pacemaker life increases. But in child where it, he, in a very active child with completely dependent on the pacemaker will have a lower battery life. Okay, thank you, Dr. Shudip. So I think we have a few more questions, but for the time constraints, we can you can answer that in the chat box. So our next topic for the session is post-cardiac <laughs> surgery arrhythmia and its management by Dr. Shubhadeep Dash. And Dr. Shubhadeep Dash, he has done his MD in pediatrics and fellowship in pediatric critical and cardiac critical care from sick kids and also at UK. And he's European board certificate certified in pediatric intensive care. He has done his FRCPC and FCCM from Canada. He's um, currently working as a consultant and clinical lead in pediatric cardiac ICU and PICU at Narayana Super Speciality Hospital, Howrah. So over to Dr. Shubhadi. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, thank you, my uh, very dear friend, Dr. Devabruto, for that uh, nice introduction. Um, and uh, thanks to WBAP for uh, giving me the stage to uh, present here tonight. I'm Dr. Shubhadeep, and I'm going to Shubhadeep present in the next 15, 20 minutes. Shubhadeep, will you stop sharing? Yes. Thank you. Shubhadeep, please carry on. Yeah. Uh, so in the next uh, 15, 20 minutes, I'm going to uh, briefly present about uh, the post-op arrhythmias that we come across in cardiac ICU. Um, I also have to say that since last night I have been having a fever, so excuse me for any subdued presentation. So as we probably have been discussing since uh, yesterday, we know that cardiac arrhythmias or dysrhythmias, these are abnormal electrical conduction or automatic changes in heart rate and rhythm. And what also we know that in children, mostly they're resultant of hypoxia, that is the commonest cause of arrhythmia. It could be electrolyte imbalance, post-cardiac surgery due to several reasons that we will shortly see. And there could be some isolated conduction system pathology as well. And why is it important to have some knowledge about arrhythmia? Because if we allow these arrhythmias to go on, then they can soon culminate into a lot of dreadful hemodynamic consequences. So in post-operative uh, cardiac ICU in a, in, a, in a setting where I generally work, it generally has what has been uh, shown in literature that the incidence of arrhythmias is about 15 to 48%. And uh, what are the most likely reasons? 
because we know that soon after cardiac surgery, they are coming off cardiopulmonary bypass machine and there, there is a lot of myocardial ischemia, there is a lot of myocardial edema. Uh, they usually come back on high level of pressure, so the catecholamine levels are high. There could be electrolyte imbalances like uh, hypo or hyperkalemia. There could be calcium level disturbances, magnesium level disturbances. And as I said, that if we don't recognize these arrhythmias early in the course of the uh, ICU, then they can have quite significant hemodynamic consequences because these children are already cardiovascularly very tenuous after a cardiac surgery. So what are the rapid assessment goals? Uh, whenever we come across an arrhythmia, first of all, it's very important. I think as a resident, it's very important to identify, yes, on this monitor, this does not look like a sinus rhythm. This looks like something else. That is something we have to get acquainted with. I don't expect all the residents in ICU to be familiar with all the rhythm disturbances, but at least we should have uh, that knowledge, uh, that clinical eye to recognize that, no, this is not a sinus rhythm. So whenever we think that this is an arrhythmia, first things first, we should exclude hypoxia and hypercapnia because these are very important causes of hypoxia. So if the patient is on ventilator, just take the patient off ventilator, put the patient on bag and see if you are able to bag, if there is any secretion which is blocking the ET tube, what could be the result, what could be the cause of hypoxia and draw an arterial blood sample and see the blood gas. Next is look for hemodynamic instability. So clinically look at the heart rate, blood pressure, your capillary ripple time, the level of lactate, and then accordingly, you try to categorize your patients into patients with good clinical perfusion and patients with poor perfusion because those would have uh, treatment implications. We also need to quickly check our electrolytes and most important electrolytes that we need to check would be calcium, magnesium, and potassium. The different iatrogenic causes, there are so many different iatrogenic causes that we come across in cardiac ICU because they are on a lot of inotropes, a lot of chronotropy uh, producing drugs. Uh, they are on potassium infusion. And also remember to exclude surgical causes. It could be cardiac tamponade. So if you think it's necessary, just get an echo done and surgically correctable causes and uh, try to identify surgically correctable causes and get a 12 lead ECG. If you think that this is a dysrhythmia, this is not something uh, which is sinus, get a 12 lead ECG quickly. But again, this cannot be your first response. First, make sure the patient is stable and then order an ECG to your nurse. And Sometimes there is something called atrial ECG that we do often in cardiac ICU, which may help you identify the rhythm. So very briefly, what are these atrial ECGs? These are actually done by the pacing wires. In a post-cardiac uh, ICU, in a post-operative cardiac ICU setting, in almost 100% of the cases, all the patients would come back with atrial pacing wires. So these are pacing wires. These are, these are some equipments which help us to pace the heart in case the heart rate becomes slow. So basically, they are electrical wires which are uh, sutured or which are hooked on the surface of the heart on the, or on the epicardium. So they can actually help us pace the heart directly and also they can actually help us to record an ECG. So try to understand this point. When we are trying to, when we are, when we are recording a 12-bit ECG, what are we trying to do? We are trying to record a cardiac impulse from the skin, but basically that impulse is generated from the heart. So it has to traverse across the soft tissue, it has to traverse across the muscle, across the skin, and then come to the uh, ECG leads. Whereas in, if you have pacing wires, then because the pacing wires are directly fixed on the surface of the heart, so these electrical conductions are directly recorded from the surface of the heart. So you might be able to identify a rhythm better. And usually these patients come back with two sets of pacing wires, one which we call a wires, one which we call atrial wires on the right atrium and one which we call ventricular wires or uh, which are on the right ventricle. I'm not going into a lot of details about this, but as I said, that it magnifies the electrical activity of the heart. And there are several ways of recording atrial ECG. Again, I'm not going into this details, but this is something that we often do in post-operative cardiac ICU in order to identify an arrhythmia. So this is an AOR study. I'll just very quickly show how it can be very helpful. So this is actually the strip above. This is actually a junctional electropic tachycardia. I'll subsequently in my presentation tell you more about junctional electropic tachycardia, but it is the 
uh, one of the most malignant tachyarrhythmias that we come across in cardiac ICU. And it's a narrow complex tachycardia and there is typically AV dissociation, right? So what happens is that you are not always able to identify P waves, but you can see that these are narrow complex tachy uh, tachyarrhythmias. Now, sometimes it may be very confusing between a junctional ectopic tachycardia and a sinus tachycardia also, and an atrial ectopic tachycardia. Now see that we have tried to record in the same patient an AVAR study, an atrial ECG, and now you can see how the P waves now become apparent and how the uh, AV dissociation now becomes more apparent. So you can see that we can see a P wave here, but no P wave here. We can again see a P wave here. So basically the V and the, the QRS and the P waves, they march independently. So this is a uh, VA dissociation, narrow complex tachycardia, and uh, very typical of junctional ectopic tachycardia. So what would be my clues in diagnosis of uh, dysrhythmia or arrhythmia? So there are some clues that we can keep in mind. One is tempo of onset, whether my tachycardia develops gradually over minutes or over hours, what we typically call is a warm-up period. That is very typical of an automatic mechanism, like a sinus tachycardia, like a jet, like an atrial ectopic tachycardia, or whether it came just suddenly, just like that. The patient was in a sinus rhythm completely. And in the next moment, you look at the monitor, you see that the patient has become very tachycardic. So this is a typical re-entry mechanism where there was a circuit and suddenly an electrical impulse fell on the wrong time. And that is why it incited a tachycardia. So whether the tachycardia is coming slowly, warm up, or whether there is a sudden mechanism, which is re-entry. Number two, you can have a look at the P waves, whether there are P waves, whether all your QRS complexes are uh, typically preceded by P waves, if preceded by P waves, whether they are sinus P waves. Sinus P waves as in the P waves are uh, upright on your lead two, three and AVF, or whether these are not sinus P waves, like the P waves could be of different morphology, which are typical of AET. Your QRS complex, whether your QRS complex is white or whether your QRS complex is narrow. And then your P to QRS relationship, whether you can actually identify your P waves or whether you have uh, a dissociated rhythm. And then another clue would be an adenosine test. So an adenosine, we know that typically it would be helpful in some of the re-entrant tachycardias like um, SVT. It can actually terminate your SVT, supraventricular tachycardia, but also it can be very, very helpful in diagnosing uh, uh, an abnormal rhythm. Like if you uh, have a patient suffering from atrial flutter and you are not able to identify a rhythm, you just think that the patient has been having SVT, then you just give adenosine, it incites a, a, a temporary AV block and then in that way, it can unmask the underlying rhythm. But always, always keep in mind that when we are running the adenosine test, just because these patients are very tenuous, always you have to be ready with your emergency drugs. And also, I think uh, somebody must have spoken about how to give adenosine it should be given in a vein close to heart and it should be given very quickly. Next, in uh, for diagnosing arrhythmia, there are some other clues which can also help you, like what form of surgery did the patient undergo? And different forms of surgery are known to have different forms of arrhythmia. I'm not just not going into details, but we know that TGA, CCTGA, Epstein anomaly, they are very uh, prone to have SVT. Uh, the, the surgeries which are done close to the junction, like uh, or, or the AV node, like AVSD, VSD, TET repairs, they can have junctional ectopic tachycardia, VSD, AVSD, they can also have AV blocks. So these are again, some of the clues which can be helpful for you. Now, as I was telling before, that what I expect from a PICU resident is that even if you are not able to identify all the dysrhythmias, at least you should be uh, acquainted with what is normal and what is abnormal. So you should know how a sinus rhythm looks like. And once you know what a sinus rhythm looks like, then you can differentiate from an abnormal rhythm. And also you have to be aware about what some of the most common and lethal dysrhythmias, which can be uh, which can actually kill a patient. Um, again, I'm not asking you to be uh, acquainted with all the cardiac arrhythmias, but when we are working in ICU, it's an emergency area. We have to be familiar with some of the most lethal dysrhythmias. So I would suggest that these are some of the rhythms like you can you can remember uh, like everything you can, if you want, to, but these are some of the rhythms I would strongly suggest you to uh, kind of remember and have a mental model of. 
So the first one, what is this? This is asystole. This is a complete cessation, uh, cessation of cardiac activity. You see a straight line on the monitor. So we immediately have to start CPR. And we know what is PEA. There is cessation of cardiac activity, but still you would see electrical activity on the monitor. Again, you have to start CPR. What is this? This is a sinus tachycardia. You can see there is a narrow complex tachycardia. It's preceded by a P wave. And this is a sinus tachycardia. And what is this? This is an SVT. It's going on at a very fast rate. Um, the RR intervals are regular. And it's a narrow complex tachycardia. QRS is less than 0 0.09. And it's a sudden onset tachycardia because there is a re-entrant tachycardia. What did I tell that re-entrant tachycardia has a sudden onset? And this is one of the most common tachyarrhythmias that uh, needs treatment in children. Again, this is another tachycardia. We often come across in uh, ICU. This is an atrial ectopic tachycardia. You can see that there's a neurocomplex complex tachycardia, but the P waves are non-sinus. And sometimes they can have uh, a Wenkeback phenomenon too. And this is an atrial ectopic tachycardia. The P wave morphology is different from your sinus one. And because there's an automatic tachycardia, it will have a typical warm-up period. That is, it develops gradually. And it is one of the rhythms which is very, very difficult to control. And so even if you inside different forms of treatment, not that there are many options, but it takes a long time to come down. And next, what is this? So here you can see, again, it's a narrow complex tachycardia. And these are like flutter-like, sawtooth-like uh, baseline, multiple P waves. So this is probably what? This is atrial flutter. So sawtooth pattern with uh, can be unmasked with adenosine, but sometimes it can be just apparent. I'm not going into the different treatment details. I'm sure that in the last couple of days, uh, you must have been uh, taught about the treatment of atrial platter, but always, always in cardiac ICU, we have to, um, we have to make sure the patient is stable. We have to address the ABC and then your basic mental checklist that the patient is not toxic. The patient's gas is okay. The patient's electrolytes are okay. And then whatever you need to do, sometimes this re-entrant cardias would need uh, cardioversion, synchronized cardioversion. And sometimes this atrial platters. In stable patients, you can also consider amiodarone, plecanide, and other stuff. What is this? This top rhythm. So this is again a tachycardia, but there is a wide QRS complex, right? So mostly this is a ventricular tachycardia. And again, the treatment will vary depending on whether the patient is hemodynamically stable or the patient is hemodynamically unstable, right? In a patient who is hemodynamically stable, we have the options of giving some lig uh, lignocaine, right? So lignocaine actually works quite well. We have the option of starting amiodron. If the patient is hemodynamically unstable, then we have to cardio, right? And then this is a bizarre rhythm. This is ventricular fibrillation. This is ventricle. Uh, this is a situation where the ventricle actually quivers rather than actual contraction. It prohibits contraction. And again, it's an emergency. You have to start CPR. And at the same time, you have to defibrillate the heart. So again, I'll just reiterate already what I just said. So when you see a cardiac rhythm which does not look sinus on your monitor, first step is check the patient. This disturbance again. Uh, this is very important because this may not be real always. Because sometimes you might think that the patient has uh, developed asystole, but your leads might have just come up, right? Right. So your leads might have just displaced. You might think that the patient is suffering from ventricular fibrillation, but the patient might be actually moving. So this patient, despite having a rhythm which seems like ventricular fibrillation, will be just awake and alert. Next, your step two. If the patient is not awake and alert, you check for responsiveness and is there a pulse. If the patient is responsive and has a pulse, then you have some time and you try to determine what is the cause of arrhythmia. However, if you have a rhythm like a stable VT, you have to remember that you don't have much time either because these patients can break into a VF or an unstable VT very soon. And step three, if there is no pulse, it's a medical emergency. The patient is at the risk of dying soon. So you start CPR and call for help. 
So another arrhythmia, so this is something I'm going to elaborate a little bit on. So another arrhythmia that we come across very frequently in post-operative cardiac ICU is junctional ectopic tachycardia. And why I'm going to elaborate on it a little bit, because uh, this is the commonest malignant tachyarrhythmia that we manage. And this is the commonest malignant tachyarrhythmia, which can have serious, serious hemodynamic con consequences. And if you are not able to identify, believe me, the patient is going to go downhill, 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 and ultimately might die. So very quickly, there is a six month old, a male boy, a, a male baby, 5.6 kilo. He's a, he's a, he was suffering from TET, tetralogy of fallow. And he returned to cardiac ICU following a TET repair with a transannular patch. The transesophageal echo, while coming off from cardiopulmonary bypass, showed that the repair was okay. There was no residual VSD. There was a PFO which was shunting bidirectionally. And, um, you know, like I'm not going to go into all these details. Uh, but anyways, what I mean to say is it was a, a good repair. In cardiac ICU, he was on epinephrine of 0.1 mics per kilo per minute, NORAD of 0 0.05 mics per kilo per minute, milrinone of 0.25. His initial blood pressure was 85, 148, MAP of 52, CVP was 11, saturation was 95%, mixed penis was 55, and lactate was 4.5. His initial heart rate was in 140s, but over the next 45 minutes, what happened was the heart rate gradually went up to high 160s, and it seemed like a narrow complex rhythm on the monitor. So this is what the monitor picture looks like. Yeah, and, yeah, two more minutes. Yeah, yeah. And you can see the CVP is around 15. So as I said, junctional ectopic tachycardia is the commonest form of malignant tachyarrhythmia in children following cardiac surgery. And it originates close to your AV node. It actually originates close to your his bundle. And it occurs in procedures uh, which are done around the AV node, like tetralogy of fallow, VSD, AVSD, etc. And how is it characterized? It's narrow complex tachycardia. As I mentioned already, it has got uh, an AV dissociation and rarely we can see retrograde one is to one P wave conduction and your ventricular rate is faster than the atrial rate because it's an automatic tachycardia. The onset is gradual and it occurs within 72 hours of cardiac surgery, but mostly it's self-limiting. But however, the patients can become very sick. So within this period of time, we have to in incite good amount of supportive treatment. So going back to our patient, our monitor picture showed it's a narrow complex tachycardia. There was loss of AV synchrony and in the current, current context, it could be jet, right? So jet, you can see here, it's a narrow complex tachycardia. You can see VO dissociation, not all the uh, QRS complexes are preceded by P waves and some of the P waves seem to be um, falling on the T wave. So this is a typical VA dissociation. So I'm just going to skip. So diagnosis of jet is not always easy. It can resemble other forms of supraventricular tachycardia. It is refractory to adenosine and cardioversion. And sometimes AVR study can be really, really helpful. So AVR study, I already showed you a picture of how to differentiate a uh, jet on AVR study. So I'm not going to, this is kind of a similar picture. So in the next 30 minutes, what happened with the patient, the heart rate went up even higher. Now the patient was having features of a low cardiac output state. That is the patient had cooler extremities, pedal pulses were feeble. The rectal temperature was 37.8, CVP was 13, the MAP was dropping, the lactate was going up, mixed penis was coming down. So JET is a very serious rhythm. We have to treat aggressively. And what are the things which um, actually uh, causes the problem in JET? One is because of the tachycardia, your diastolic filling time in less, is less. And because you have AV dissociation, so that's why you use the fourth atrial rapid filling phase or the atrial kick. So that is how, how you use 25% of your cardiac output, which is very essential for infants, right? So what are goals of inter intervention? One is to control the heart rate. It's very difficult to control the rhythm, but we try to control the heart rate and achieve AV synchrony. So in general, what we do, we try to correct the electrolyte disturbances. We try to correct the fever. We try to bring down the temperature in order to uh, reduce the oxygen demand. We try to use muscle relaxants for uh, shivering thermogenesis. And we try to reduce inotropes and catecholamines as much as possible. Not, not that it's always uh, possible, but we at least try. And we also try to optimize analgesia because there is an automatic tachycardia. Anything which increases your sympathetic drive is going to be harmful. So we try to optimize analgesia. Dexmedidomidine is a drug which can reduce your heart rate. You correct the acidosis, hypoxia, anemia. You correct hypovolemia. And 
uh hemodynamically unstable patients not responding to general measures amiodarone is a drug that we can use and once you achieve a good rate control then we can use our pacing wires to pace the heart in order to achieve av synchrony and in refractory cases we use ecmo sometimes as a bridge to tem as a temporary bridge to recovery so what did we do in our patient so we cooled down the patient the patient was 37 8 we cooled down the patient to 36 degrees celsius we reduced our epinephrine we corrected our magnesium we sedated with dexmedidomidine and also intermittently paralyzed over the next two hours the rate reduced and then we paced to 155 in order to achieve av synchrony However, in the next day, the patient's heart rate again went up to 175. We ruled out any residuals on echo. We started the patient on IV amiotron. The patient remained stable with amiotron over the next 24 hours, over the next eight hours. Then we gradually lifted the muscle relaxant. The sedation was weaned off. The patient was gradually rewarmed to normothermia, and we extubated on POD3. So that is actually how you manage check. So in my last slide, what I'm just going to reiterate is that these arrhythmias are not at all uncommon in cardiac ICU. And sometimes it may be really daunting for us to identify a rhythm. As I said, that A wires or epicardial pacing wires can be really useful not only for uh, pacing the heart, but also in diagnosing a rhythm. And for residents working in ICU, it's very important to be familiar with some of the very, very basic rhythm disturbances. Thank you. Excellent presentation, Dr. Shubhadi. So uh, I think we can take the questions in the chat box. So we'll move on to the uh, last topic for this session. So it was a pending topic from yesterday evening. So the topic is ECG changes in acquired heart disease by Dr. Lopamudra Mishra. Dr. Lopamudra, she had uh, done her MD pediatrics from Lady Harding Medical College and then pursued DM pediatric cardiology uh, from EMS New Delhi. She is currently working as assistant professor in the Department of Pediatrics at IPGM and SSKM Hospital. She has numerous publications in index journals and presentations in national and international <laughs> conferences. So over to you, Dr. Lupa Mudda, please. Dr. Shubhati, you can stop sharing your screen. Yes. Please. Thank you. Shubhati, you can answer in the chat box. There are a few questions. If you for your topic, you can answer that. Yeah. Uh, am I audible? And my slides are visible? Yes, Lopa, you are audible and your slides are visible. Please carry on. Uh, first of all, I, I want to thank the West Bengal IP, IP for giving me this opportunity in this prestigious, uh, uh, prestigious symposium to present. And uh, my topic for today is the, um, the ECG changes in the acquired heart diseases in children. Uh, though we know that the acquired heart disease in children is much lesser than the adult counterparts, but the causes may be varied and the identification and the management may be uh, difficult. So we need to know about them. So first of all, where the most common is the myocarditis followed by pericarditis, which might be complicated by pericardial diffusion and rarely constricted pericarditis. Then comes the Kawasaki and MIEC group, which the cases are rising now. And it has already surpassed the acute rheumatic fever and rheumatic heart disease as the commonest cause of, uh, in commonest infective or commonest acquired cause of, uh, uh, commonest cause, acquired cause of heart disease in children. And then among the cardiomyopathy group, dilated cardiomyopathy is the most common, followed by the hypertrophic cardiomyopathy, which is more common in the adult age, adult age. And then we can have rarely restrictive cardiomyopathy or endomyocardial fibrosis, and very rarely ARBC. And in another spectrum, RB, when RB is affected, we can have the pulmonary hypertension, rarely pulmonary embolism. Infective endocarditis may affect the valves and which uh, can cause uh, multi multiple complications. And then comes the hypertension and very rarely ischemic heart disease. So we'll discuss this acquired heart disease with some case scenarios. Uh, first of all, in the first scenario, a five-year-old old boy presented with history of 12 days of fever with rash, oral edema, non purulent conjunctivitis, and inorator enlarged uh, limb node. So we all can understand most probably this is a case of uh, Kawasaki disease and on day 14, he developed chest pain. The ECG shows, uh, 
so you can see uh, there are some uh, t t wave changes and the subsequent ecg shows st elevation and uh, some deep t waves so uh, so this is a case of myocardial ischemia the myocardial ischemia as we already discussed that it is much rarer than the adult uh, adult age but uh, still there are various causes which cause the uh, can cause uh, can uh, can lead to the myocardial ischemia in children and the, some of them are coronary congenital coronary an anomalies we have already learned about, about the alcapa or some major uh, coronary uh, uh, coronary osteal uh, atresia which present in the uh, in the um, younger child but uh, some other causes like coronary osteal stenosis like in william syndrome or any case of anomalous origin on the origin of the coronary artery from the opposite sinus of valsalva that might present in the older age group especially in the adolescence especially during the exercise when they are combined with some intra arterial or intramural force there can be fibromuscular dysplasia kawasaki disease among the congenital heart disease like a tga patient when they are having intramural force or uh, top patient which are having a major coronary artery branch crossing the rdot when they undergo operation they their coronary arteries may be affected and then like they can present with the ischemic myocardial ischemic changes among the coronary artery acquired coronary osteal stenosis sometimes after the tga uh, in tga arteries after arterial switch repair they might have a coronary um, osteal stenosis similarly we can get them in case of ross repair ross procedure after for aortic valve disease other and other other causes of coronary ischemia might be a coronary insufficiency which we, we might might find in the case of marfan syndrome takayas arteritis a cystic medial necrosis some traumatic mi may be present and in case of dilated cardiomyopathy ar or pda sometimes very rarely myocardial ischemia like findings we can get in the ecg other causes are the coronary thromboembolisms due to some uh, pro thrombotic states inflammatory conditions like viral or eosinophilic myocarditis or we can get them in case of uh, due to the arteros atherosclerosis which might we find in case of orthotropic ortho cardiac transplant familial homozygous hypercholesteremia or any other cases of diabetic dyslipidemia and nephrotic syndrome renal the renal artery renal uh, the renal uh, chronic renal disease or renal failure patient also have accelerated uh, coronary vascular disease and rheumatological patients also can present with this myocardial uh, ischemia so how to diagnose myocardial ischemia first of all we had need to know what is stemi and what is instemi or unstable angina stemi means there is st elevation but the di uh, the diagnosis is based on there, there is there has to be a uh, st elevation in two contiguous leads with cut off points of more than 1 mm in all leads except v2 and v3 for v2 v3 it is age dependent it has to be more than 2 mm in males greater than 40 years and greater than 2.5 mm in the males less than 40 years and uh, in for in you know, females it regards rates of age which has to be more than 1.5 mm but along with the uh, st elevation there has to be reciprocal st decoration in electrically opposite leads on the other hand the non st elevation mi there will be st depression of 0.5 mm or more in the two contiguous leads with or without t wave inversion greater than 1 mm in the leads which are prominent r wave there may be some stt other changes which is non specific and one important point is that dynamic stt changes has to be there which can differentiate this uh, instemi or the unstable angina from the other causes of st depression uh, that we might see in case of hypertrophy or digox in case of digox in uh, treatment but we have to uh, understand though the definition wise it is more than uh, 2 mm in the v2 or v3 but if it is a uh, if we have a ecg to compare previous ecg to compare if then new change of 1 mm might be important and in the children there is no specific data ke what should be the uh, cut off but uh, as the uh, uh, chances of ischemia is less the threshold might be little higher like 2 mm for all le all precordial leads we can uh, accept as uh, as a cut off for the st elevation but again we have to think in the clinical context if the child has a previous kawasaki disease or any hyper familial hypercholesteremia then 
we have to uh, we have to consider a minimum one millimeter elevation also important. So as I was discussing, the ST elevation has to be accompanied by the ST depression in the diagonally opposite, electrically opposite leads. Like if we have a layer in ST elevation in the lead one or ABL, then ST depression must, it must should be present in the lead three. And if there is a ST elevation in the lateral or posterior chest leads, then ST depression should be there in the V1 to V3. But again, uh, this, uh, um, this ST elevation and ST depression, they're always not present. And it has also been seen in the autopsy studies. They always doesn't correlate with the, uh, the, uh, the coronary artery, which coronary is affected. It's not always possible or not always clear cut from this uh, changes in the uh, surface ECG. So here we can see that uh, the, uh, we have to, they are the J point. We need to measure this ST elevation at the J point. And we, uh, we have to compare this uh, elevation with the baseline. The isoelectric baseline mostly is taken as the TP segment or PR segment. And sometimes in case of uh, TMT or exercise testing, we take a J60 point, that is the 60 millisecond after the J point, that is the point between the end of QRS and beginning of the SD segment. So uh, we have to, but if the ST segment is symmet symmet uh, symmetrical, it is a horizontal, then the J point and J60 point will be the same. So what are the um, what is the um, timeline of the changes in the initial phase in, uh, in very initial phase the ECG may be normal then we can have the relatively tall broad based asymmetrical uh, this T wave and then it is called hyperacute T waves. Following uh, this uh, the, then the T waves gradually decreases in size and it may be uh, then the P wave starts um, inverting. With initially, we have a biphasic T wave followed by a completely inverted T wave. Deep T waves can be seen. It's a complete transmural infarct. And ST elevation we get in the acute phase, but ST depression may be found when the ischemia, only ischemia present, not infarct, or in the later phase of the acute injury when the acute infarct has, uh, has, passed, has become passive. And several dyspnea and ectopy secondary to ischemia also can be seen in these patients. So the changes are hyperacute changes. That is the ST elevated and deep and uh, wide T wave. Then there is the gradually the T waves are decreasing and biphasic T waves we can see. Then the late evolving phases phase that is two to three week even uh, only the inverted sharply inverted T waves were present and deep and uh, wide T waves can be seen in the resolving phase the T wave become normalized by the Q wave present, which usually indicate a, a chronic ischemia or a late ischemic changes. But in some cases, the T wave may remain inverted. So this is the same thing. Uh, it is shown in the pictographical manner that it, what is the changes that can be seen. And depending on the defar the uh, there is some variation in the changes in the T waves. And in case if uh, the ST elevation remain, uh, ST remain elevated, that might indicate that there is aneurysm formation in the LV apex. And now coming to the localization of the MI, as I already discussed that sometimes uh, though we, uh, depending on the lo location where the ST elevation uh, is maximum, we want to uh, know in which coronary artery is involved, but it is always not straightforward. So uh, conventionally, the septal uh, leads are uh, taken as the V1 and V2. So if the ST elevation is maximum, then we say it is a septal MI. Similarly, anterior MRI in the V3 and V4. And uh, uh, in lateral MI, it is 1 VL, V5, V6. Anterolateral is, uh, that is the 1 AVL and V3, V6, a beat from V3 to V6. An excessive anterior anterolateral is when the V1 to V6 and 1 and ABL uh, ST changes, ST elevation can be seen. Inferior uh, MI is when, when we have change ST maximum ST elevation into 3 ABL. And in the posterior MI, uh, in the posterior MI, uh, there is only ST depression we can, can be seen in the V1 to V3 unless we use the posterior leads. Sometimes, 
uh, both anterior and inferior MI, MI can be seen together, but rather than involvement of the two coronary arteries, it's mostly like uh, due to the LED, wraparound LED, very long LED, which is supplying both the anterior and inferior valve. So for if we suspect the posterior MI, because uh, if uh, there is reciprocal ST depression is present in the V1 to V2, that is the mirror image, then we have to use the uh, posterior leads, that is V7, V8, and V9, and uh, which might indicate uh, the ST elevation. And in these cases, we have to remember that even the 0.5 millimeter ST elevation may be significant. Similarly, if we have uh, inferior ST changes, then also we should uh, check the right, ventric right ventricle in the V3R and V4R leads because sometimes, uh, sometimes the RVMI is associated with the inferior MI and RVMI management is dif uh, difficult and is different from the L uh, other MI management because L RV is preload dependent. So if we don't use fluid and use only the vasodilators like nitroglycerin, and uh, then uh, what will happen? The RV uh, mode RV dysfunction can happen. So it is it is essential to uh, recognize. Now coming to the STEMI equivalence, why we don't have actual the ST elevation, but the clinical consequences, the myocardial involvement are similar to the uh, MI. So what are those? One is left male coronary artery stenosis. In these cases, there is widespread ST depression and only ST elevation in the AVR, which is more than the V1. So, and then we can have, a, uh, then we can, in, uh, they can have the precordial Q waves. Um, so then we can have the precordial T waves, uh, which are, uh, uh, then we can have a precordial T wave, uh, which is, um, Then we can have only T wave, inverted T wave in the, uh, in the uh, <clears throat> only have inverted T wave in the uh, leads. That, is, that indicates that it is the valence side. Only the inverted, large inverted T waves will be present. And also we can have a D winter sign where there is be upsloping, uh, upsloping ST depression with tall T waves. So these are the scenarios where it is, uh, it is uh, ST elevation is not present, but it is actually STEMI. And also the new onset LBB is also considered to be a case of, uh, to, to be a case of L, uh, STEMI. So here we can see that ST upsloping ST depression uh, uh, with tall T wave. So it's indicate a D winter sign. On the other hand, myocardial ischemia, as we have discussed, there will be ST depression. But depending on the severity of the ST depression, the uh, consequences are different. Like if only one millimeter depression is there, that is my uh, that is mild uh, ischemia. But if it is a uh, is more than one millimeter and it is involving a multiple leads, then the severity is more. Like it is more than two millimeter and more involving more than three leads, her mortality is much higher. And one another thing, if the ST depression is localized to a particular territory, then it is more likely a reciprocal change into STEMI rather than actual ischemic changes. Because in uh, no, normally the myocardial ischemia are low, uh, it is typically present in the variable number of leads. ST depression in the myocardial ischemia may be of upsloping, downsloping, or horizontal. But the downsloping and horizontal is more specific, and upsloping ST depression is uh, it is uh, it is uh, difficult uh, to say whether it is due to the myocardial ischemia or it is due to other cause. It is non-specific. T wave inversion also it is has to be more than one millimeter and has to be present in more than two continuous leads. Pathological Q waves. The path of Q, all Q waves are not pathological. Pathological Q waves are those which is traditionally told as more than one millimeter or 40 millisecond wide. But okay, now, you have two more minutes. Okay. If the sequence, if uh, uh, white Q waves are present, then it is, has to be more than 
uh, but now it is it is more than 30 millisecond is considered significant and it is more than 2 mm deep and more than 25% of the depth of the qrs complex so um, so if the st segment elevated then apart from this myocardial ischemia there are several causes which can lead to st segment elevation one of important of them is the pericarditis so another scenario where a uh, boy presented with the sharp retrosternal pain in the chest and pericardial lab was audible so we can see here there is st elevation with concavity upwards and there is some pr depression so this is a case of acute pericarditis and if along with that the enzymes are higher then it may be a case of acute myopericarditis so how to differentiate that uh, with the uh, how to differentiate with the pericarditis with the other uh, stemi so there are some evolving changes will be there initially with the st elevation will be there the gradually uh, st uh, comes down and then there will be t wave inversion and in the stage 4 it will normalize so uh, how to differentiate with the hydrostatic um, um, in stemi because in the stemi the uh, st elevation may be convexity upwards or but here it will be concavity upwards stemi also can present with the concavity upwards st elevation and then there will be reciprocal changes in case of stemi but in pericarditis there will be no reciprocal changes stemi usually involves a specific uh, specific coronary artery uh, pattern but some continuous leads will be involved but in the pericarditis diffuse involvement can be present and pr sub depression will be usually absent in case of stemi but in some cases of atria if atrium is also infarction is also present then pr uh, pr depression may be present and all cases of pericarditis doesn't have a pr depression we also need to uh, differentiate acute pericarditis with the been early repolarization syndromes so there are some point to us whether it is a early depolarization or pericarditis we do the difficult it is very difficult to differentiate if there is some tissue patterns in the slight oscillation in the uh, in the upward in the uh, qrs then it is a called a fishhook pattern if it is present it is more suggestive of the benign early repolarization and there will not be any pr depression there will be prominent t waves and in the v6 the st segment and t wave ratio will be less than 0.25 in case of benign early repolarization and it will be more than t uh, point uh, 0.25 in case of pericarditis there is another sign that is the uh, tp segment is tp segment depression is present that is called spodic sign that is more uh, that is uh, more um, precision more precise uh, that we can uh, that is more uh, selective for the uh, more selective for the pericardite in pericardite because only 5% patient will have this uh, will have this sign in case of stemi so another scenario where we can have a muffled heart sound raised bp low bp weak pulse and this is a case of pericardial massive pericardial effusion so what are the changes we can have here we have a very uh, small qrs complexes and there will be a non specific t wave inversion and changes and there will be uh, electrical alternance that means one large uh, qrs complex followed by a small qrs complex another scenario where uh, we can have a high bp so these patients will present with the lvh so lvh is uh, one thing we have to understand that the ecg in to diagnose lvh both voltage and non voltage criteria has to be has to be present and it has a high specificity and low sensitivity ecg has a very high specificity and low sensitivity for diagnosis lvh so voltage criteria already we have dis discussed that Uh, from the our previous speakers have discussed what should be the criteria for lvh non voltage criteria will be then one increased roa peak time that is more than 40 45 millisecond that is called delayed intrinsic rate deflection there will be st secret s segment depression and t wave inversion in the uh, discordant changes so means that if the qrs is uh, positive then there will be st segment depression and t wave inversion and the vice versa there can be left axial deviation and left atrial enlargement 
so there are multiple lvh criteria but the important for the children they are non specific not not uh, suitable for the children and even they say less than 35 years this criteria are, are not very specific and uh, so uh, so we have to for diagnostic lvh we need to know the what should be the cut off for the age according to the cut off we have to diagnose whether they at the child has lvh or not So Lopa, can just quickly wind up. Yes, yes. So uh, similarly in the LVH, we can uh, in the ECM we'll have a dagger-like QS that is very specific for the ECM, deep, narrow dagger-like QS, and uh, there in if case of apical ECM, we can have a giant picardial QS inversion. In case of pompous disease, that is a small smaller kids uh, might present with the ECM. We'll have a gigantic QRS voltage with a short PR. So uh, another uh, scenario when the child present with the right side info, and then we need to also rule out the uh, pH. So pH changes are also we have uh, right sided involvement, right axis deviation, right atrial enlargement, and right ventricular hypertrophy will be present with some right bundle bundle branch block. And RS R dash complex with B R with R R dash will be more than ten millimeter. And small infects, it has to be more than fifteen millimeter. So, uh, like LVH, the RVH also has criteria. But more important for the children is the age-based cutoff. We have to have, have to be present. So, in the right-sided, in the V one, V two, the R well will be prominent, and in the V V five, V six, S well will be from prominent. And RS ratio, both RS ratio, right axis deviation. And R O V in V one, V two, and S O V in V one and V uh, five and V six has to be uh, the cut off has to be more for the diagnostic R V H rather than a specific cut off which is used for the uh, adult. In the R V H in newborn is very difficult to diagnose, and here the axis has to be more than one eighty to diagnose R V H. And there will be a Q R pattern if it present, then it can be a, a R V H and upright Q R. If seen after three years of age, then also indicate it may be a RVH. Similarly, ECG changes can be some changes can be present in the pulmonary embolism, which has a specific pattern S1, Q3, T3 pattern. Though it is specific, but it is rarely seen. And ARVC already it has been discussed. Though it is a congenital cardiomyopathy, uh, it present as uh, in the adolescent age group and adult age group. So it present like uh, acquired heart disease. Similarly, biventricular hypertrophy we can see in some cases. DCM and other myocarditis mainly present with the atrial and the ventricular enlargement. Some hypertrophy also may be present. Some with LVB, RVB, or interventricular conduction defect, and there will be pseudo infarct pattern. Poor RO progression with QS complex will be there in one to four, and frequent VT and VF will be also be present along with VPCs. Restricted cardiomyopathy also similarly low voltage QRS complex will be there. Some bundle branch block, non-specific STT changes, and in these cases, the AB blocks can be seen. Acute rheumatic fever also can present with tachycardia, bradycardia. Uh, uh, you are not able to cover everything in a single talk, so yes, uh, yes. so I will I, summarize yeah. it. Okay. Uh, so, uh, <clears throat> so coming to the. Uh, uh, Penultimate uh, slide that uh, the acquired heart disease are rare in children. Causes are varied and management is challenging. But we need to identify them early and accurately so that a life can be saved. And ECG and an indispensable tool for that. So ECG's role cannot be overestimated. Thanking you. Thank you, Dr. Lopamutra. Uh, for your excellent presentation, I think you have uh, covered most of the topics, although we are just running a bit short of time. So I think we'll uh, quickly move on to a last session of this uh, three-day CME, CME, and this more and probably... There were both any question left, I think, Dr. Anil Singh has Anil Singh answered. has already answered most of the questions. So uh, I think... Now, we just mass delay, we have to go to quiz, I think. Uh, the uh, quiz yes, station. It's already 8.15, yes. Yes, yes. Right so I would like to invite Dr. Rohit Bhumi. So he'll be conducting this quiz session. He's working as an assistant professor of pediatrics at AIMS Kollani. 
and he will be conducting this uh, quiz session online over this uh, mentimeter app so over to you dr roy uh, just uh, just i am interrupting i request all the panelists not to join in this uh, quiz competition so please enjoy uh, tension free Okay. Because for the uh, transparency of this uh, competition. Oh, uh, good evening, all. Uh, thank you, uh, Dr. Devabrata, for uh, introducing me. Uh, Lopadi, Lopadi, please uh, stop the screen. Yeah, yeah. Stop screen sharing, please. Yeah. So uh, I welcome all the participants. And the onset, I'd like to thank uh, West Bengal Academy of Pediatrics and uh, for inviting me. Uh, for this quiz session and uh, hope all the participants and attendees enjoyed the session for last three days. So uh, before starting, uh, I just want to take uh, two minutes to show you the app. So is my screen is visible right now? Yes. yes. Yeah. So it is very simple app. The link has been shared in the WhatsApp group as well as in the uh, zoom chat box so once you click on the menti whatever the code i, I shared uh, the next step one cartoon will appear you just uh, have to enter your name which was uh, registered for the cme then it will show as a join quiz you wait till i start it will show as get ready to play your name will be shown just sorry to interrupt. Please mention your name, otherwise, you will not be identified during the result. Yeah. So, so uh, then the screen will appear like that. Please uh, don't uh, press uh, till we start the quiz. In between question, also, it, it may appear. This screen may appear. For that time, no need to uh, put uh, any, any button, like no need to click rejoin or reload anything it will automatically questions will appear in your mobile phone it is better to join with uh, a different uh, gadgets it's better to join with your uh, mobile phone and once the quiz is started you can leave this zoom platform you can see your uh, results later uh, once the 25 questions will be over the results will uh, appear on your mobile phone only so after joining it will show like answer first to get more points. Please wait for a few seconds. Then the question will appear like that. For example, which Indian song recently won Oscar award? Five, four, three, two, one. Then the options will appear like this. Suppose another question, I felt tower is situated in. Four options will be there. You have to click on your mobile phone screen. It is fastest finger first. The best, the right answer, the full marks is 1000 points. And if you, uh, as fast you answer, you will get more points. The least possible number you will get is 500. This is uh, within the particular amount of time for each, each question, usually 15 to 20 seconds for each question. If the correct answer, the number will be divided from 1000 to 500, depending upon how fast you are clicking the answer. In between the questions, you may get this kind of uh, cartoons. You did not vote in time. Most likely it will from the lag of network from uh, the opposite side because I am using as much as uh, fastest uh, possible band, the 5G band. You may get wrong answer. You may get it loading results or you may get it that your point or where you are, you are placed right now. Once the answer is there, it, it, in your screen, it may pop up like correct answer or wrong answer. So uh, th that's all. So any, any questions? Uh, they have to uh, log in from their mobile. So if they are using uh, the Zoom from the mobile, they have to just uh, leave the Zoom and go to the Mentimeter, isn't there? Or otherwise, they can do from the two devices: Zoom in laptop and Mentimeter in the uh, mobile. Or if you are doing it from the laptop, then they can do simultaneously. I think both. Yes, and uh, no need to see the Zoom screen. Though I will uh, present it on uh, the, I will share the PPT. 
but uh, you no need to uh, do anything in the zoom platform neither question no need to see the question everything will be on your mobile phone or if you open the your say, uh, mentimeter window everything will be there so you can leave the zoom and the link somebody is asking link is there in whatsapp group link is there right now in the zoom also so shall we start sir Yes, how many joined? Uh, oh, you, uh, yes, you go to the open the Mentimeter. Let's see how many has joined. Yeah. Twenty four. It is showing. Uh, it would be more than twenty four. Others, I think, will be joining. Twenty six. So I'm waiting. Twenty-eight slowly it is increasing. The panelist will be joining, but they will not give any answer. Okay. Yeah, yeah, sir. Wait for a few more minutes, two, three minutes, less the others to join. Yeah, yeah, sir. Sir, uh, please let us let me know that when to start because I am in now in the Mentimeter window. Okay, okay. It okay, is also fine. visible through Zoom, sir. Yes, yes. 30 right now. 30. Hmm. 32. For delegates, anyone uh, finding any difficulty in joining Mentimeter, please guide how to join quiz. Uh, one participant is asking you have a we have given a link in the uh, chat box also in the whatsapp group click on that go to the mentimeter app then you have to write your name there and you will enter in the quiz no need to download the app just enter it will show as get ready to play your name will be there and wait for the quiz, quiz to start would you go out of the uh link then again uh, put your name correctly someone has put the uh, name incorrectly yeah and and the reload option suppose the network lag is there you are missing something or a phone came in between that then only you can reload or you can uh, put the code number that also i shared mm -hmm. but automatically if you are logging till the quiz is over you can reload and uh, you can join but you may lose some questions in between if what name in uh, in wh what name you have joined mention that in the chat box he is not able to change actually gurudeep uh, mention your name yeah if you are not able to change no problem you just uh, later you just clarify that which code and again the thank you dr lopa and uh, dr devbrotha for uh, sending the questions the majority also question Malubika of... has sent some questions. Okay. okay, okay. So majority are questions by uh, the teachers who taught you during the last few days. Uh, I think 35 have joined. Uh, uh, yes. So uh, I think we can start now, Rohit. Yes. Okay. Okay. So so the first question will appear now it is showing us the first question came what is the most common abnormality in secondum material septal defect options are there below in your screen four colors are there i am also checking in my mobile so it is appearing no problem is there Okay, so the right answer is RSR dust pattern and uh, almost 1829 people answered. So I'm going to next question. Yeah, almost 36, everyone is ready now. Question number two. Identify CITAS and position in ECG. ECG is showing.
Citus solitus, uh, Citus inversus, and dextrocardia. The correct answer. So, 12 and 24 people answered. Question number three. 33, 34 players join. 33 players. Low voltage ECG may be present in the following situations except obesity, pericardial effusion, hyperthyroidism, subcutaneous emphysema. So, majority correct, uh, the correct answer, 30, 30 people voted. Question number four, almost everyone join. A three months old child with severe left ventricular dysfunction, ECG is as below, probable diagnosis, severe coarctation of aorta, dilated cardiomyopathy, alkappa, severe mitral regurgitation. Nineteen people gave correct answer. This is Alcapa. Question number five. What is the mean QRS axis in a term newborn? Eighty degree, hundred twenty degree, one sixty, ninety-five. Almost everyone voted. 20 people gave correct answer. It is 110 degree. Question number six. Everyone join. Identify the patient with the following phase, long ejection systolic murmur and the following ECG. Probable diagnosis. You have more time for this question. Altoram, Alagili, Nunan, Turner. Because you have to see the face, you have to see the ECG, we'll, more time is there. So, Nunan, here also majority people voted. Question number seven. PR interval is calculated from best possible answer. Start from P to end of R, start of, of P to start of R, start of P to start of Q, start of P to end of Q. Best possible answer. So majority voted. Question number eight. Two SCGs are there, A and B. Here also you have 20 seconds, more time because you have to see which drug caused this changes in ECG. So, majority corrected is sodium channel blocker. Question number nine. Three year old child with high grade fever, ECG taken in a view of one episode of unresponsiveness. Diagnosis. Supraventricular tachycardia, heart block, sinus arrhythmia. Everybody voted.
क्वेश्चन नंबर टेन आइडेंटिफाई द प्रोबल कार्डिया कैनोमली एसोसिएटेड विद द फॉलोइंग इसीजी ट्वेंटी सेकेंड्स टाइम लुक एट द इसीजी केयरफुली डोंट बीन हरी ऑप्शन आर डीटीजीए एलटीजीए फिशकॉ साठ सुपर इन्फीरियर वेंट्रिकल इवन यू कैन मैग्निफाई इन योर कंप्यूटर आल्सो और 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 इन योर मोबाइल मेनी पीपल गिव करेक्ट आंसर आंसर इज एलटीजीए क्वेश्चन नंबर इलेवन Eleven year old boy came with unconsciousness after initial resuscitation. ECG was taken. Twenty seconds. Look at carefully. You can zoom also in your mobile if you manually. If you want to see closer, you can zoom also. So correct answer: long QT. क्वेश्चन नंबर ट्वेल्व व्हाट इज द फाइंडिंग इन द एक्सरे लेफ्ट वेंट्रिकुलर एन्यूरिज्म पेरिकार्डियल इफ्यूशन पेरिकार्डियल कैल्सिफिकेशन डायफ्रामेटिक कैल्सिफिकेशन सो मेनी राइट आंसर पेरिकार्डियल कैल्सिफिकेशन क्वेश्चन नंबर थर्टीन डे टू प्रेजेंटेड विथ सेचुरेशन ऑफ एटी थ्री एक्स रेड शोइंग दिस सो मेनी करेक्ट आंसर दिस एपस्टीन एनिमोली नंबर फोर्टीन टू इयर ओल्ड गर्ल विथ ड्राउजिनेशन शॉक इज जी शोइंग दिस इमीडिएट मैनेजमेंट कार्डियो वर्शन इज द करेक्ट आंसर क्वेश्चन नंबर फिफ्टीन सेवन मंथ ओल्ड प्रेजेंटेड विथ स्ट्राइडर ब्लू डिस्कलरेशन ऑफ द बॉडी एक्सरे शोइंग दिस व्हाट इज द डायग्नोसिस so absent pulmonary valve syndrome question number 16 identify the following x ray So many correct answer is Kimita syndrome. Question number seventeen. See the face and see the ECG. You have more time. Twenty seconds for this.
Many correct answer again, Williams syndrome. Question number 18. Most common cardiac anomaly associated with the given syndrome. Question number 19. Which cardiac anomaly is commonly associated with the given picture? Bicuspid aortic valve, many correct answer. Question 20. Which cardiac anomaly is shown in the chest x ray? Many correct answer it is TGA. Question number 21. Which, which cardiac anomaly associated with the given picture? Sinus venous ASD, osteum primum ASD, osteum secondum ASD, common atrium. Many correct answer is osteum secundum ASD. Question number 22. Identify the syndrome, identify ECG. Which cardiac anomaly associated with this syndrome? Truncus arteriosus. Arrhythmogenic right ventricular cardiomyopathy. Which of the following statement is wrong? Any correct answer? Question number 24. Six year old child presented with syncope. But Rohit, ECG was not. Uh, yeah, sir. Yeah, sir. Two, two. This question will be nullified for everyone. Okay. Some network issue there because it is nullified for everyone. One question is missing. So last question. Identify the ECG. So round result will come, sir. Yes.
अभिषेक राज एंड नारायण संतुका सर दे आर बोथ द सेम पॉइंट नो नो अभिषेक राज इज वन फोर सिक्स नाइन वन एंड इफ यू सी सर वन थ्री जीरो 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 एट एट इज नारायण संतुका थर्ड इज शौम दर्शनी वन ओके different points sir it is there sir in the screen also uh, yes yes you can find you see abhishek raj narayan santuka second you can see only abhishek raj but other uh, we can see uh, in the background you can see in the background uh, uh, okay. yes, narayan okay. santuka uh, 13088 and uh, okay. so modar sarshini bhuyan uh, is 10 10556 So congratulations, Obisek Raj, for winning this co- quiz competition. And so, uh, Obisek, if if you can write and Narayana and Shomo uh, Darshan, if you can write in the chat box, uh, so uh, your institute, your contact number, and uh, uh, where are you from? Shomla, uh, can you add them uh, in the uh, on the uh, in the panelist group now? Because only thirty two are there. Muslim, Bolun, can you make them? Obisek uh, Raj, Narayana Santuka, Ashomodar Sini. These three join the panelist link. Okay, okay. Obisek Obise, Obise Raj, just one second. Obisek hmm. Raj, are they registered, sir? All are. Obisek Raj, Obisek Raj, Narayana Santuka. The link just to accept got to be. Then next, Narayana Santuka. Narayana Santuka. And Priya, uh, uh, Shomo Darshini, Shomo Darshini. So uh, we are sending you the link. Uh, please accept the chat box so that you will be uh, in the panel, so we can see you. Obisek Raj has already joined. Narayana is third, third one. Shomo Darshini. In the WhatsApp group, I share, sir. May sir, can you just once more you? Uh, third, third one. Meet the Shomo Darshini. अभिषेक Narayana, okay. Narayana has become it's a become a habit to uh, grab the quiz uh, prizes. Last time you oh, also got it. Anyway, Obisek has come. Please introduce yourself. A uh, very short. Uh, sir, I am Abhishek Raj, third year postgraduate trainee from Mal Medical College. Okay. From Mal. Mal. Okay. Congratulations, Abhishek. Okay, congratulations. So you uh, send your uh, I will uh, uh, your phone number is there. You send your account details to either uh, to Shomnath Da. We have a prize of rupees three thousand for the winner of this quiz. And congratulations, you have won the uh, first prize. Okay. Second is also there, sir. Narayan. Narayan. Unmute and uh, show Hello. your face. Yes. Hello. Yes. Very good evening, uh, teachers. Uh, this is Dr. Narayan Santuka, senior resident from SCB Medical College, Kota. Okay. So you are there also in the fluid electrolytes workshop. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Yes. So, so congratulations. Also, also share the banking details so that we can transfer the uh, prize money. Absolutely, sir. Thank you. Okay, so uh, second prize is rupees three thousand. We'll send that in. Somo Darshini. Uh, good Somo. evening, everyone. Uh, myself, Doctor Somo Darshini Bhuya, third year postgraduate from SCB Medical College, Katak. Oh. Okay, congratulations, Somo Darshini. Thank you. And you also send your de- account details uh, to yes. uh, group or in the Doctor Som uh, or to Somnatha. Then uh, we'll send in the bank transfer. Okay. Yes. Sir. 
Okay. Uh, Misa, just uh, one comments from three of them. Any any uh, technical glitches you find with the app, or any any suggestion from your side? Because uh, Abhishek or Shomadarshini or Narayan Santuka. Because hello. what else you want? If you have any feedback, you can say. And what uh, workshop do you want next? Because we want to improve. See, it is a, all of us want to improve. Sandara and Santuka participated both the times and won. So anything you want to share with us or any, any of the... Uh, sir, I would like to just say one thing that uh, this time the content was way too much. Like it was a bombardment of knowledge like every second. So probably this particular webinar, yeah, we could have spaced it over a period of four days or maybe divided it into two separate uh, say programs because I understand you have your own difficulties, but this was way too much, way too much to you know gulp it in in three days. I understand that we have to be prepared ourselves from before, but still it was something uh, very, every, every, every presentation had something new in it. So it needed a lot of time to gulp it in, sir. Quiz. Okay. Thank you. Good suggestion. Any okay, quiz thank you. related, app related? That was absolutely normal. Only thing is that one ECG didn't come at the yeah, yeah. number 23rd or 24th. Otherwise, yeah, yeah, for everyone. Perfectly uh, running. Perfectly running. So, should we conclude, uh, Mihir? Yes. So, last of all, just uh, or request all faculties and the uh, also uh, to open their videos. We'll take another one picture, last picture. And all faculties, please open your video. Somnath, the first time I saw Madhavika. Actor peak, actor Somnath, the Apne ko chobi nite par mera kanti ke. Lopa, please. Doctor Lopa Mudra, please. Dr. Lopa Mudra? I, I don't think she is here. Okay, Jekata fine. Uh, the knee in it, though. I will request Dr. Shopon Roy to just conclude. Hello, uh, first. Yes. Thank you, uh, Mihir. Uh, I must uh, uh, gratitude to all the faculties who have shared their knowledge. Uh, with the three days, and as Narayana and Obishek has shared, it was really a uh, bombardment of the knowledge. In fact, I couldn't assimilate uh, so much, and I was a very obedient student for the last three days. So, uh, thank you very much. And all the experts and the mentors, particularly Dr. Mihir Shankar and our permanent quiz master, Dr. Rohit Bhog. So, and obviously, Shomnatha and all the attendees uh, who have joined from every part of this uh, country, not only from West Bengal, for every country. So, your feedback is really essential for us. We are planning for another six such workshops in future. So, Dr. Mihir uh, Sharkar is the instrumental in it. I must uh, thank him. And please do join with all your friends. More and more you will join, uh, it will be more inspirational for us. Thank you, everybody, and good night. Uh, bye. Uh, so, lastly, I just uh, want to mention these uh, three trials uh, Lopa Mudra, Devobrotha, and Malubika for being the instrumental for uh, arranging the uh, conduct, co coordinating with the, all the faculties and uh, formulating the program. So, uh, uh, my uh, gratitude to them and also the Somnadha was working very hard. So assimilating all the registrations, sending the email and the WhatsApp, adding them to WhatsApp group. So again, uh, thank you Somnadha and West Bengal IAP and lastly, of course, the Rohit who was not directly involved in this uh, symposium, but uh, he had to take all pain to assimilate the questions and uh, put in the Mentimeter app. The Rohit is again, a permanent quiz master. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, sir.
yes 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 and and all the the delegates yes, uh, we uh, salute your uh, enthusiasm and the energy uh, after this uh, fluid electrolytes also there was a huge number of registration but maybe due to some uh, their work uh, they are not able to join in person but they will get the videos and that will be remain as a treasure for them they can uh, cons <coughs> see the video later on and they can uh, clear their doubts okay any uh, thing uh, 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 lopa uh, and malobika yes if you have uh, want to say a few I, lines I, I, I must uh, say one thing i don't know who is dr suyay choudhury is and he has made the program very much interactive uh, I, I, if suyay is there i request him also to uh, come over here suyay are you there somrat the suyay is there yes yes Is at him uh, as a panelist because of your industry. He was uh, putting all the question and make the interact because Onil was not able to uh, face up with him actually. So uh, would you want this type of uh, attendees also? So we accept what you know. We must congratulate him. Is later Dr. Sujay Chowdhury is to join in between I Malubika, Lo Lopa Mutra, Devobrot, and Malubika. Uh, this yes. Uh, so i would like to thank uh, west bengal academy of pediatrics and especially professor shapan rai sir uh, madam and uh, meet the specially because uh, you know this topic is very pertinent because uh, we have almost like you know forget the uh, forget seeing the ecg and the x ray we just you know just do the echo directly and like you know there are some uh, guys uh, like uh, medical research guys who have come up with a stethoscope and they are telling that you know you just put the stethoscope on the precordia and they will detect all the murmurs like you know amidastolic murmur mitostenosis they will give the diagnosis so so this clinical it is almost like gone so i think this this uh, ecg and the topics are very pertinent for uh, the trainees so thank you again everyone topa yeah it was a very uh, uh, even for us also it was uh, we learned many things from this uh, symposium and it was a uh, it was very the enthusiasm of the all the mentors and uh, participants were uh, visible uh, but introduction i think uh, only one or two of the participants are interacting most of them were not uh, so that part we might uh, need to improve so that won't be possible without physical uh, meeting so it's difficult to to that in the uh, this that form malobika thank you sir uh, thank you all participants uh, the participation uh, must be much more sir uh, the interaction should be much more uh, it was much less <laughs> few people were interacting throughout sir and suja ultimately suja i want to see suja so it has not joined have you made it somrata join koriyechen okay no no uni accept korchen na ami link patachi onake ekta note please accept please 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 Yes, yes. Uh, so here we conclude the, our uh, fluid ECG and uh, X-ray symposium. And good night, everyone. Uh, probably we'll meet in the next month with the uh, echocardiography and ultrasound. Uh, and uh, hope to 